So I think we'll get uh, started, uh, folks, this morning. A few more folks coming in uh, from outside. First of all, thanks for coming uh, on this beautiful spring day. It's, uh, I woke up this morning, I went out to get a Hamilton Spectator, and, uh, and went to, had to walk through a snowstorm to, uh, to get to the uh, newspaper box. So a little surprising for, uh, for April 20th, uh, but uh, it is blue, some blue sky out there and, and some nice weather. So thanks for uh, making it from uh, the various parts of Hamilton you're from. And, and I know uh, just by looking around, we've got uh, folks here from, uh, from all throughout uh, the, the new city of Hamilton, if we can still call it the new city, uh, from Flamborough, from Glanbrook, from Stony Creek, from Dundas, from Ancaster, and a few folks from outside as well. So we've got a great representation uh, across the, uh, the, the scheme this morning, so that's great. So uh, we are uh, put together uh, something here today, and, and I'll uh, speak in, in more detail uh, in a couple of moments, uh, but the Citizens Forum on Heritage Conservation, and we're gonna uh, be here till uh, just after uh, lunchtime, or just after noon, rather, uh, and, and our purpose today really is to, is to learn, uh, and we have some excellent speakers here today who are going to help us uh, with that learning part of, of uh, the day today. And the uh, interest today also, in, a, in, a, in an equal fashion, perhaps even more of an important fashion, is to act as well. So we're learning and we're, we're taking what we learn and we're, we're going to act today as well uh, in, uh, in uh, action towards protecting, conserving, uh, Hamilton's cultural heritage. So I won't say a lot more because I've got uh, a few more things to say in a moment, but I'd like to uh, begin by saying this has been a, a great joint effort to, uh, to organize this event, and I'm not going to name everyone who is uh, involved because there's a number of folks from across the city who are assisting in this, but the uh, event is formally being uh, sponsored, uh, organized by the uh, Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, the Hamilton Chapter, uh, the Municipal Heritage Committee, some of us still call it LACAC, I guess we're kind of allowed, if, can't say that in this, in this uh, building, but we, we still call it LACAC. Uh, and uh, of course the Hamilton and Burlington Society of Architects. So the three organizations along with the City of Hamilton, uh, the Ward 1 office I guess in particular, uh, sponsoring the event this morning. I wanted to, uh, to also uh, note that we've got uh, Councillor Maria Pearson here. Where did Maria go? She's over to my right. Uh, uh, Maria is, is a longtime member of the Municipal Heritage Committee, Black Act, uh, both uh, here in, in uh, you know, since 2001 here in Hamilton, but uh, for many years uh, previous to that in the city of Stony Creek. Uh, 1991? 1992 uh, in Stony Creek, Black Act, so lots of history um, uh, Maria has that she brings to a Municipal Heritage Committee here in Hamilton. I don't see any more politicians, I don't think it's always. Sometimes they hide, they, yeah, no, they're not here, it's okay. Good. So, and I also, just, just before uh, moving on, I, I wanted to, uh, to recognize uh, Dale Brown from the Ward 1 office uh, up front here. Uh, many of you interacted with Dale as you became involved in this and received emails and, and uh, all the, uh, the detailed work, which is always the hard work, the important stuff that happens behind the scenes is the work that uh, Dale Brown does. So uh, thanks very much. In fact, a round of applause if you don't mind. That's great. So with that, uh, I'd like to call on uh, three individuals to uh, bring words of welcome from their organizations. Of three, and we'll begin with uh, Alyssa Denon-Robinson uh, to uh, talk from uh, LAC Act, Municipal Heritage Committee. Well, on behalf of the Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. It's, it's fantastic to see so many people here in this room, so many interested heritage uh, people, and, and I want to thank you all for, for coming. Um, for those who don't know who the Hamilton Municipal Heritage Committee is, uh, we are a group of um, volunteers. Uh, there's 11 of us on our committee. We, were all, we went through a, a process of, of uh, representing our different areas, coming in and interviewing, and, and we were picked because we had some sort of expertise or interest in heritage. So on our committee, there are representatives from each one of the outlying areas. We have Glamberg representatives, Stony Creek, Dundas. So we would really 
if you're in an air, a resident in that area, if you're one of the heritage societies, to make contact with that person. Really, they're your representative on our committee. And we also have three municipal councillors on, on, on that committee as well. And what our job is to do is we advise council. We advise council on all matters that relate to the Ontario Heritage Act under Part 4 and 5. And that's really what we're looking at. So we're looking at heritage uh, permits. If someone's looking to do something to their designated property, we're reviewing those applications and helping that property owner make the best decisions for, for their property and making sure that we can maintain the heritage uh, attributes that, that are on that property. Um, on behalf of the committee, again, I'd like to thank everyone here. I'd also like to thank Councillor McCaddy for uh, all the work he's done in spearheading this, um, to all of our guest speakers, to uh, all of the, the co-sponsors on this. We've really worked together as a collaborative team to get this organized, and all of the Heritage Societies for coming out, and I think we're really going to need that body of volunteers to, to help us move forward. Um, what I have here, this is our volume two. This is the list of 7,000 properties that are architecturally and... Additional uh, sponsor is uh, the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, the Hamilton Chapter, and, and uh, Barbara, Barbara Murray. Thanks, Barbara. Good morning and welcome to everyone coming out on a Saturday morning. The Hamilton Region branch of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario is uh, very pleased to have been uh, invited to be a partner with the Municipal Heritage Committee of Council for this uh, initiative. As Alyssa has indicated, the Municipal Heritage Committee is the advisor to Council under the Ontario Heritage Act. Uh, the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario was founded in 1933, long before that act existed. And its uh, very 1930-ish uh, terminology of its mission statement is to um, appreciate and preserve places of built and natural beauty. Over the years, it has um, evolved, and Hamilton, in fact, was the very first branch in 1961 of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. Today, we now number 25 branches, ranging in the southwest from Windsor, as far north as Muskoka, and as far east as nearly Kingston. The branches are very uh, different. Some branches, most of us have in common that we do tours, either house tours, walking tours, some kind of public education. Um, some are directly involved in saving uh, buildings. A couple of them own buildings. And informative lectures and presentations to their communities, photo contests, and of course, in many cases, doors open. So it's a wide variety across the uh, province. Uh, the provincial, and we all form under the one umbrella of the uh, provincial organization, the ACO. The ACO is a registered charity. Uh, the ACO has um, offers with its membership um, a twice twice a year um, news magazine called Acorn. The next one is due to come out in uh, March. And uh, the ACO at a provincial level uh, gets involved with things such as the uh, real estate um, RICO, a real estate uh, organization of Ontario doing a course for realtors. It's been complete. It now looks as though we're going to need to put it out to the branches. It's not been had uptake by RICO itself. We've also worked nationally with an organization on insurance for heritage organizations. A number of years ago, uh, through a Trillium grant, we sponsored and funded the study of heritage conservation districts, and at that time it included our first one here in Hamilton, the Charles McNabb one, um, and uh, in terms of what it did to property values. So these are just some of the initiatives that we have. But coming back locally to Hamilton, um, in the early days, I understand in doing some history for the 80th anniversary of the ACO, um, we were involved, along with the whole community, in getting Dundurn restored as a, as a museum. Sandyford Place, Bayfront Park. In more recent years, we focused on an annual exhibit at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, uh, usually in the fall, including Stanley Roscoe of this building. And now, uh, what we've really been focused on the last few years is Doors Open. In two weeks, our 11th Doors Open event will take place here in Hamilton. 51 sites, 14 are new, 45 on Saturday, so check the, check the details and pick up your guidebook. 
outside the door, 43 on Sunday. Uh, we are pleased to be uh, partnered. It is a project of the local branch, but we are pleased to be partnered with the Hamilton Burlington Society of Architects, you're seeing a connection here, as well as the City of Hamilton Tourism and Culture Division. So once again, thank you for coming, and thank you for the opportunity to tell people about ACL. And the Hamilton and Burlington Society of Architects uh, have been very busy recently. I think they had uh, a meeting this week, and I was at an event yesterday that, uh, that the architects were busy. Uh, uh, tactical urbanism, was that the uh, very interesting uh, term, tactical urbanism? We'll hear more about that. Rebecca Beatty. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. On behalf of the Hamilton Burlington Society of Architects, um, for those of you who are unaware of our organization, we're a group of local architects who are all members of our Ontario uh, Association of Architects, which is the organizing um, body for architecture in the province of Ontario. Um, we get together about once a month, and we it's a very loose group of individuals who are architects and interns as well, some students. And we pretty much promote architecture in the city of Hamilton. That's our mandate. So we um, have events that we run. Um, and coming up, we've got, as Brian mentioned, tactical urbanism, which is happening. Uh, the, pre the final presentation for that charrette will be on May the 2nd. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, please let me know. We do have a website as well. We're also involved in Doors Open, as Barbara mentioned. And um, we have an art show coming up in August at the Art Crawl, and we're going to be doing some events at Super Crawl as well. So we've been really, really busy this year, and um, the Ontario Association of Architects has sponsored us generously to, um, to address issues that are affecting Hamilton right now. Um, I want to thank Councillor McHattie and his team for pulling involved in it, and um, I'm happy to see so many people here. So I think I will pass the floor back over. and. And I just, uh, we want to get to our speakers, so I'll be, uh, be brief, but I just want to provide a few more remarks, maybe in, in the context of uh, why this forum, why now uh, in particular, and how this sort of uh, came about. And uh, I don't have to tell everybody in this room how important uh, heritage is, uh, cultural heritage, conservation of uh, cultural heritage is to a city. When we, when we travel, uh, whether it be uh, throughout uh, parts of Canada, United States, or uh, perhaps down to Mexico, elsewhere, or over to Europe, uh, we often uh, choose to travel to places that have exceptional history, that have uh, that sense of, of, uh, of, of decades, uh, centuries of, of uh, care for, for how cities or towns or countrysides, for that matter, were put together by, by humans as, as we evolved uh, as a species throughout the years. So it's, it's important to, to all of us, and I was trying to think of a way to convey that, to, to speak to that, and I, again, uh, up early this morning thinking about this event, um, I uh, had a chance to look at the spec, and, and some of you uh, will have seen this already, but uh, Ashley Bell, uh, Ashley is uh, with uh, Willowbank, the Willowbank uh, Restoration Group uh, out of Niagara-on-the-Lake, and they're going to be doing some lecture series here at the Pearl Factory uh, uh, shortly, so maybe, maybe we'll talk about that towards the end just to, so people know about that again. But she had a, a tremendous article in The Spectator uh, today, and I thought I'd just read uh, a little bit of it uh, to give you a, a sense of, of what uh, heritage conservation means to her, and I think means to many of us, certainly means to myself. Ashley says, heritage conservation is not just about demolition or reuse, renovation, restoration, or replacement. On a broad level, it is inherently about a cultural attitude toward where we live, what we value, and how our, how our built environment reflects our values. It's about respect for the past as much as about the current impact on our environment. It's about what future generations will inherit from us as well as those who go before us, have gone before us. In theory, we entrust government with the role of protecting, facilitating, and supporting the things that we value. Yet, it is our actions as citizens that reflect what we care about and ultimately, through those actions, 
we have the power of change. So that, I thought, spoke perfectly. I don't know, perhaps Ashley was thinking about this event as she uh, put together her, uh, her comments in the, in the Spectator today, but I, I thought that perfectly captured uh, why most of us are here, why most of us care, how we're involved in the heritage societies, municipal heritage committees, various organizations, why we do the work we do with, uh, with historical buildings here in Hamilton, uh, adaptive reuse and, and other things. So for me personally, why now? Uh, I've sat on municipal heritage committee along with Councillor Pearson for the last decade or so in my case. Uh, and throughout those 10 years, it's been, it's been a frustrating experience where uh, we uh, all the time seem to get buildings that are under threat uh, and we're, we're always reacting. We're always, always trying to, to race around. We hear about something, we race off to Dundas, we race off to Glanbrook head down the street to the gore and, and say, stop, you know, what, what are you doing? And, and we were often fi finding out about things rather late in the process. As you know, uh, under the Ontario Building Code Act, uh, buildings can be uh, demolished. In fact, they, they, uh, once the de demolition uh, permit is requested, they ha that demolition permit has to be issued within 20 working days. And uh, it's all behind closed doors. The chief building official is not doing anything wrong at all. They're actually mandated to do that under the, under the Act. Uh, and I, I think it was really for me and for many of us, uh, the Sanford Avenue School that was really the, the strong wake-up call or perhaps the last wake-up call uh, on what uh, happens uh, when we don't know about uh, the demolition permits until it's too late. And we weren't involved in that process. So, so we know through the uh, Ontario Heritage Act we have an opportunity to place buildings on something called the register and we'll find, find out a lot more about that today. And that provides 60 days of protection, a chance to think about, a chance to evaluate what's going on should a demolition permit be requested for one of these buildings. Uh, so that, that is something we'll talk a lot about today is this register. And as you know we have a list of 7,000 properties of, of cultural heritage interest in the city. That was compiled uh, right in amalgamation in 2001 from all the area municipalities, all the lists that they had at that point, as well as the, uh, the old city of Hamilton list. And that list has largely remained the list, and you've heard that term. And uh, I can tell you when you talk to the politicians, we say we've got 7,000 properties on the list. They just kind of roll their eyes and, and you know, what are we going to do with that? That's an extraordinary number. We can't protect all those buildings. Uh, so, in, in fact, we haven't done anything with the list, or very little with the list, in terms of protection here at, at the city, at City Council. We have about uh, 30 properties now, I think, on the register. A couple more added this week. Nice uh, at planning committee, a couple more uh, properties protected. Westdale uh, Theatre was added to the register this week, or uh, it'll, by planning committee. And uh, Delta uh, Secondary School uh, as well. So that, that's good news. But this list of 7,000, uh, we really need to find a way to tackle that. And I, I, I don't think we, in fact, I know we can't leave it up to the city to do that. There is a project to look at downtown properties uh, at the city level. But that's about 1,000 properties or so. There's still another 6,000, or we suspect more than that, uh, perhaps uh, ones that uh, haven't really been uh, added to that list in the past. So really that's what we're, we're about today in, in my mind uh, as we work through the, the different speakers and hear about things. Uh, we'll come back to you at, at the end of the morning and say who's up for tackling that list? How are we going to do it? Uh, and how are we going to get uh, a large number of those properties identified? Uh, are they still there? Uh, photographs identified so we can go back and work with the Planning Committee, Municipal Heritage Committee, the Planning Committee and City Council to get as many of those properties uh, as we can on the register and then start thinking about designation and other options we might have. So this is very much a mission-oriented uh, meeting this morning. Uh, I'm highly motivated as the, the councillor, as I know Councillor Pearson is. Uh, she's frustrated on you know, all the work that was done in Stony Creek uh, back before amalgamation, which really hasn't translated into, into the protection that we need. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we're going to do today. So I think it's a bit, of, a bit of a call to action, I guess, is how I've been phrasing this at Municipal Heritage Committee. Uh, and it's, it's time for us as citizens uh, to say, who, you know, does anybody care? Does anybody care about heritage in Hamilton? If they do, now's the time to step up and get these buildings uh, conserved, or as many as, as makes sense. And really, it's in our hands, which to me is the exciting part. 
Uh, I don't want to say the city's doing it because that takes everything out of our hands. It's up to us as citizens to make sure these buildings are identified. And I think by our discussion this morning, we'll learn about how to do that and hopefully uh, leave here plugged into the Heritage Societies, plugged into Municipal Heritage Committee, ACO and others, the architects, and we can work together to make sure that happens. Well, that's the call to action. And uh, at this point, uh, I think we should get right into our speakers because there's some fantastic folks that have uh, been so good to join us here this morning. And the first is Jim Leonard from the Ontario Heritage Trust. I'm going to call on Rebecca to uh, formally introduce Jim. Rebecca? Jim Leonard, right here, joined the Ontario Heritage Trust in the fall of 2010 as the first Ontario Heritage Act Registrar. This is a new position created to develop and manage the statutory provincial heritage registry. From 2003 to 2010, Jim Leonard was the municipal heritage planner for the city of Brampton. He was Brampton's first full-time heritage coordinator. In that role, he put forward several initiatives intended to establish a municipal heritage infrastructure for the city. In 2010, the city of Brampton received an honorable mention under Lieutenant Governor's Community Heritage Leadership Award. And in 2011, they won that award in recognition of the longstanding heritage program. From 1994 to 2003, Jim was the city archivist for the city of Peterborough and was also a member of the faculty of the museum management and curatorship program offered jointly at Trent University and Sir Sanford Fleming College. Jim has served on the boards of Community Heritage Ontario, the Ontario Museum Association, and the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. He has been a member of the Peterborough Architectural Conservation Advisory Committee and the Brampton Heritage Board and he currently serves as a director on the board of the Ontario Historical Society. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see a great turnout for this forum today. My presentation is focusing on heritage designation under the Ontario Heritage Act. So looking at that data that we have, that we've been amassing, we are now in a position where we can sort of look at some of the numbers and look at take a, 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 a province-wide perspective. So this presentation takes that province-wide perspective It also looks at how Hamilton, has, how Hamilton fits into that. So I think I'm going to assume that everyone here knows what the Heritage Act is all about and that it came into being and they with royal assent. So I won't go through this list of the, the functions and the role of the acts. I think that's probably well known to the majority. Next slide. But just to illustrate what ultimately in the big picture it's meant to do is to discourage the loss of heritage resources, properties of cultural heritage value. And these photographs demonstrate some of the, what I would consider examples of either the loss of heritage fabric or its demolition and alterations and things of that nature are, are discouraged. And this is the sort of thing we're trying to encourage, sensitive pedestrian friendly development, proper scaled additions, and adaptive reuse, and a program of conservation. Next slide. The three major types or sections of the Act that apply to designation that are used regularly in the province, two of the three are really regular. Archaeological sites is not used as often. Section 29 are part four designations, individual designations. I'll talk mostly about that, but also heritage conservation districts under part five, and then, as I mentioned, archaeological sites, but there really are only a handful of registered archaeological sites. In terms of the, a little bit of historical perspective and the current big picture scope of where designations stand in the province today, since coming into being in the mid-1970s, the very first designation was in, under the Heritage Act in Ontario with Sandiford Place here in Hamilton. Does everyone know that? That it was the very first? In fact, from I understand, talking to my director, that uh, Back in August of 1975, just as the Lieutenant Governor was signing the Heritage Act into law, as Royal Assent was done, as soon as that pen was put down by the Lieutenant Governor, the Mayor was on the phone with Queen's Park, signed the bylaw designating Sanford Place. Yes, the time was of the essence in order to conserve that property. So it, the City of Hamilton has a distinction as being the first municipality that had a designated property. 
Today in Ontario, there are 7,000, or just slightly under 7,000 designation bylaws on record at the Trust. But over the years, municipalities are supposed to serve, that's wording from the Act, bylaws on, on the Trust or the Ministry. Some have not been served. We estimate maybe around 25 to 20% 20 to 25%, I suppose, of bylaws that have been passed by municipalities never made it to the Trust. So with that in mind, there's probably close to around 8,000 bylaws of act representing actual designated properties in Ontario. In terms of overall ranking, Toronto, the City of Toronto comes in with the most bylaws at almost 700, followed by Kingston at 525, Ottawa is third, and ranked fourth is the City of Hamilton at roughly 246 bylaws. So that is quite a distinction, I think. Geographically speaking, uh, the most designations are in the Greater Toronto Area, and that's probably not surprising. That's the greatest concentration of built resources, and most designations focus on built heritage resources. And southwestern Ontario, and then southeastern Ontario, and it gets a little, little bit thin after that. That the near north and the far north have very few designations. Only 90 bylaws have been sent in over the last 30 years or so, 40 years, and then the next lowest number is represented from the Muskoka Perry Sound area at 55 bylaws. Then within Ontario, there's several pockets where there are no designations at all, never have been, never seems to be any indication there will be. It probably comes down to staff capacity or a lack of awareness as to what the act is about. This, the same numbers represented graphically, GTA is slightly ahead of everybody else. And again, these, the GTA is probably the most municipalities with heritage planning staff, and that, that is partly why there are more designations, concentration of properties. Next slide. The Ontario Heritage Act's been around since 75, and the era when there were the most designations going on, when municipalities were seemed to be the most active with a very concentrated proactive effort was the 1980s, right five to 10 years after the act was passed. Municipalities were really using the act to protect properties, and of course in this era there were also grants to help uh, maintain them and conserve them. The 1980s saw an average of 237 new bylaws per year, and the single peak year for, since the act's been in, be, in place was 1984 when 263 designations were passed around the, the province. That number has gone down, now it averages about 140, 141 bylaws per year. Right, through the 2000s and, and even now. Next slide. So you can see from this chart how things went on a surge through the 1980s and then a dip slightly down through the 90s, and it's been holding steady ever since. But you could suggest that there was a slight decline, kind of flat, in the, in the last 10 to 12 years. There's 445 municipalities in Ontario. This is post, post amalgamation. Just slightly over half have at least one designation in place. That means almost half the province have no designations at all that we know of. And many municipalities don't even mention the Heritage Act and it, it just doesn't register with, with a lot of the municipalities, especially in eastern and northern Ontario, it seems. And. Um, some, some municipalities have passed designations where there perhaps may just be one bylaw in place, um, and then there's municipalities that have not done any more designations since, in this few examples, since the 1970s, in the early 1980s. So of that number of 250 that have designated, many of them haven't designated more than one or two at a time. There's a handful of municipalities, perhaps 50 to 60, that remain, that have remained active ever since the act came into being. Next slide. In terms of recent activity under the Act, the City of Toronto, and this is the last three years, two to three years, Toronto has remained busy keeping its ranking up there, number one, with 90 bylaws passed since 2010, followed by Chatham-Kent and working our way down. Again, GTA municipalities in the most part, Prince Edward County in eastern Ontario, become more active in recent years. They've hired planning staff. And as, I guess, pressure for development has started to merge in that area of Ontario, they've ramped up the designation programs and the municipalities become more proactive. And that works up to the, to the that's the top 10, so you get a sense of just how busy municipalities are typically. In many cases, they're playing catch up. 
I, I used to work in the city of Brampton, and through the 1990s and the early parts of the 2000s, there were no designations. Then council decided to become proactive. This was also a period when Brampton was becoming more and more under pressure to, for, for development. And so the, 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 the municipality and the municipal heritage committee determined that it's time to really catch up and try to be more proactive with designations, and that's still going on today. As for the city of Hamilton, the last bylaw we received was September 2008 for the William Thomas building. Next slide. In terms of overall administration of designations, only 6% of the municipalities in the province have one full-time heritage planner or more. That's just 28 municipalities. And in other municipalities that don't have dedicated planning or, or dedicated heritage staff, they may assign the role to a, a, a planner as a part-time function, or it may be under, under volunteers with the Municipal Heritage Committee. And in some cases, the clerk's departments take on that role. We also track heritage permits that have been served on the trust. Under the Act, municipalities are, are to serve permits and other documents in particular that relate to the properties that are designated. We don't have a great many because not all the municipalities are aware they have to do that. But we do have around 500 from 28 separate municipalities. And as you can see, almost all of them, virtually almost 100% are consents or approvals by council. So very few permits that come before councils are denied. Some are approved with, con with conditions. And generally speaking, they're not terribly onerous conditions. So if people suggest that designation prevents change and alteration, that, that's a number that clearly states that's not so. Something that's a, a trend that's emerging in municipalities now that actively designate properties is a, a push to amend old inaccurate bylaws or weak bylaws. When the act came into being in the 70s, it was focused on architectural conservation and historical value. The act has evolved. Its scope has been broadened over the years to focus on con context, cultural landscapes, and there's a, now a specific criteria that everyone has to follow across the province. And with that in mind, municipalities have looked at their old bylaws and have actively beefed them up, strengthened them to bring them up to the current standards under the Act. And this is something that's important. It's not just the numbers of, of designations in place, it's the quality of the designations in order to, to serve as protection and to, to act as a, a tool to measure when a proposed alteration is coming through or when there may be an issue over prosecution. You need a solid bylaw in order to important decisions. In terms of the types of designations, I mean, I put the word unique in quotes because essentially all bylaws are unique, obviously. But there are certain ones that sort of that stand out in, in for different reasons or another. There are almost 50 designations focused on trees or landmark trees or tree features like alleys and hedgerows. That's gone up quite a bit in recent years as the Act has broadened to focus on more than just uh, Victorian buildings and so on. Wayne Gretzky's home in Brantford is designated. It's a 1960s split-level property. The Roseneath Carousel is a designated property, an unusual feature in, in, near Coburg. Swimming pools have been designated. There's actually two in the province that are. There's a train car in, in Clinton. The, the, it's called the, train, or the school train car, designated property. Milestones in, in Eaton Township. And a portion of a brick road in Welland is designated, and that's a picture of it. More unique properties, Cox Terrace in Peterborough. It's the only Second Empire row house in Canada. There used to be one in Winnipeg, but it was demolished some years back. And as the 1950s and 1960s becomes identified as culturally significant, Modernist resources are now being designated as well. There's a photograph of the, a gas bar canopy in Mississauga that was designated a couple of years ago. 1960s, that's called Googie style architecture. Street lights, street lamps in, in uh, Chatham. A wooden water tower for train station in Barry's Bay. And a stone house in Peterborough where Sir Winston Churchill slept in 1902. So essential historical value represented there. I mentioned that the Heritage Act covers not just individual properties, but under Part 5 Heritage Districts. The official designation of number of designated districts in Ontario now is 109. And, but there are 110 bylaws because one municipality, St. Mary's, has a bylaw that's on hold right now because of an OMB appeal. 
We estimate about 17, possibly even 18,000 properties are designated within all 109 districts. We're currently tracking almost 16,000 because we've been adding individual properties that we know are within the boundaries of the districts in the province into our register as a way to monitor the numbers. And surprisingly, there's another 40, even more than that, but probably closer to 45 districts that have come, have been proposed or are actually pending but haven't been finally approved by municipal councils, or they were put forward, pitched to, to the communities, and uh, the communities or the councils ended up either with cold feet or just decided for whatever reason not to proceed. So there could be several more coming in the next few years. Next slide. In terms of who came first, the first district to come into full force and effect was Meadowvale in Mississauga when the OMB approved it in 1980, December the 9th. But the first bylaw to be passed was Berryfield in Kingston in April of 1980, but it wasn't approved till the following year. So there were two firsts, and depending on who you speak to, one will say it's Mississauga and the others will say it is Kingston, and it's usually a little... In terms of types of districts, just over half are urban residential areas and then followed by downtown commercial cores and then rural crossroad hamlets as those are the three major categories of districts. Next slide. A variety of different types. Single property, the only one that is a bona fide single property is Fort York in Toronto. Obviously, typically, a, by definition, a district covers a, a streetscape, an area that usually involves 99% of the time more than one property. The only district that really focuses on industrial heritage resources is a fairly new one that came in through Lambton County, the oil heritage area that commemorates the area where the, the first oil fields were discovered in North America. The largest single district is South Rosedale with over 1,100 properties. That's extremely large. Most of them are in the 300 property area. And then, as I mentioned, village and crossroad hamlets are very common. White Vale and Pickering, Berryfield, Churchville and Brampton and so on. And there's a few districts now, as I said, the shift towards looking at modernist resources as heritage. This building we're standing in, of course, is designated and is an icon in terms of modernism. But for districts, there are a few that have come into being in the last few years. Union Station area, for one, which includes the Toronto Dominion Towers, those Mies van der Rohe landmarks in downtown Toronto, and then very recently, Barry, or, or, uh, Briarcliff in Ottawa that was just passed. It says 2010. That's actually was when it was proposed. Bylo was just passed. Next slide. In terms of administration of districts, a surprising number are only 28 of 109 we know of have subcommittees to sort of focus heritage conservation oversight. Most of the other ones are managed by the municipal heritage committees broadly. The number of districts with incentive programs is 80, that's 75% or so. So most municipalities that have established districts have also put in place incentive programs to help maintain the properties. And again, in terms of management by staff, Districts tend to be, I would say, labor intensive or high maintenance, if you will, and 80% are have staff as well. As I mentioned before, there's a trend towards amending individual designation bylaws to bring them up to current standards. That same dynamic applies to districts. Old district plans or non-existent district plans are being looked at, and where they weren't in existence are being developed. And where they were, but they weren't particularly strong, they're being revisited and amended and broadened and again beefed up. And four have been amended since 2007, since the last update, major, major amendment to the Heritage Act. And there's five more that are currently underway. So just as a weak individual bylaw can be a ticking time bomb, a weak district plan or non-existent one, even worse, can be a problem as well in terms of managing the districts and maintaining them properly. They need to be revisited periodically. Next slide. There's, as I said, individual designations have flatlined in a sense. They've, they've leveled, but they're still at a respectable number. But as I say, about 140, 141 a year. The numbers of heritage conservation districts, on the other hand, have actually started to surge in a way. About half of all the districts that now exist, that 109 I mentioned, were passed since the year 2000, and the majority of them were passed since, say, 2006 or so. So municipalities are seeing the, that districts work. 
and you know, the work for the Heritage Resources Centre and the ACO have done to provide real hard data has demonstrated the effectiveness of districts. And the best evidence to prove that a district works is, is the districts themselves. And I think as more and more municipalities see that they do work, they have embraced the notion that this is an extremely effective form of conservation. Next slide. How they illustrated with a map, this is how the districts pan out. 39 different municipalities have at least one district. That's still a small number of the province. Only 9% of the municipalities in Ontario have any districts at all. And those three large dots represent where they're heavily concentrated. Next slide. And here they are, every municipality that has at least one district. Toronto is the most with 19, Ottawa next with 18, and Hamilton ranks third with seven. And then it works a, a single district. And the only district in northern Ontario is Thunder Bay. There are no others uh, above near north and further up. That's the only one. Next slide. In terms of Hamilton, as I've already mentioned, some of these numbers and rankings and so on, Hamilton ranks third for districts, fourth for the number of Part 4 designations. Hamilton was the first, as I said, municipality to pass a designation bylaw, Sandford Place. Hamilton also has the most built heritage conservation easements with the Ontario Heritage Trust with 19 properties. They have 15 sites that are national historic sites. The city has apparently 17 uh, cultural institutions, that's according to the Ontario Museum Association. These are all very, very respectable numbers. Next slide. Hamilton has been participating in Doors Open since almost since its inception. And for Hamilton, I believe it was 2003, with very strong attendance records year by year and growing each year. The city has a very uh, active awards program and a strong, varied program that focuses on downtown revitalization that I would say is, is an example for the rest of the province. As we mentioned, a large heritage inventory, it's not a register, but it's extremely large with 7,000 properties. The city has been a leader in dealing with issues of property standards, vacant buildings, and emergency preparedness. And I remember when I was working at Brampton, when I was looking for examples of standards bylaws to, to apply to our city, I looked at the, to this city and uh, a few others, but definitely Hamilton has been one that I've, I always would have relied on for help. And with that in mind, it's also got a very strong heritage planning program, and it's had heritage staff. The city's had heritage staff for several years. I don't quite know how long, but for as long as I can remember, there have been heritage planners in this city. That's my presentation. So it was a quick overview, the state of things in the province, and also how Hamilton fits in with things today. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Michael Seaman, the Director of Planning from the Town of Grimsby. And if I can ask Donna Reed uh, from the ACO to uh, introduce Michael. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Seaman. Michael and I, have our paths have crossed at a number of heritage conferences across the province and across the country. Michael is currently the Director of Planning for the Town of Grimsby, and he recently completed a term as the Ontario Governor and Vice Chair for the Heritage Canada Foundation. Previously, he was Manager of Heritage Planning for the Town of Oakville, a Senior Heritage Planner for the Town of Aurora, and the City of Markham. Coincidentally, all three of these communities are winners of the Heritage Canada Foundation Prince of Wales Prize for Municipal Heritage Leadership. Michael is the past chair as a volunteer of the Brampton Heritage Board, president of the Brampton Historical Society, and currently editor for the Ontario Planning Journal. Michael is originally from Northampton, England, and though he works in Grimsby, he lives in Hamilton in the village of Waterdown. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I've been asked to uh, talk specifically about registers, but I'm going to go over sort of uh, some general heritage uh, ideas and principles. And uh, I just returned from the uh, United States Main Street Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I think it really showed an example of a community that really cares about its heritage and how they've made heritage pay in a way. I mean, there's a huge industry for just cultural tourism and uh, and in terms of the sense of place and people, the heritage really is part of what, uh, what makes it their community. And, uh, and I think when you look at the most successful communities in terms of livability across the world, really, uh, heritage is, is right there. And 
Could be here. It's here. Um, so why conserve heritage resources? Just going to give you a bit of an overview. Conservation and, and preservation of the built environment play an essential part in understanding communities' past and are important in protecting its future sense of place and historical continuity. A heritage tells us who we are, where we've come from, and what we've accomplished. It's a source of strength and confidence and community pride that puts the changes of society into, into perspective and helps us to build a better future. Heritage brings quality of life, enhanced sense of place. It's the St. John Market in uh, New Brunswick, which maybe some of the modern developments don't do. And nothing wrong with staples. It's a good, good shot, but, you know. Um, enhanced sense of community and identity. When you look at the traditions and the people that were at places and the people, and the, you know, the grandparents and parents that were there, and, and, uh, and now you're there today. Economic health. I mean, it's probably the, one of the most sustainable things to invest in in our, in our economy. I mean, you've got local people working in local trades, looking, using local materials, not driving very far to get those materials, and um, maintaining uh, local, local properties. It's all money that keeps locally as opposed to getting new materials from halfway around the world, sticking them on a boat. And I mean, it's just so much more sustainable, so much more investing back in the local community. Heritage creates exciting community spaces and acts as a catalyst for compatible development. And uh, as Heritage Canada likes to say, it's the greenest building that already exists. And uh, so there are many benefits of heritage conservation. And how, how, do, we, how do we get there? And uh, I'll, give it, I'll give a nod to Philip Hode on this one. He was a great help in getting this building done in, in Grimsby. So some of the tools that uh, become apparent to me in terms of uh, how, how we get there with heritage planning. Knowing when to fight and when to use diplomacy is a, is a key one. I mean, you can't, there's only, only when you've got 7,000 properties on your list, there's only so many battles that you can fight, but knowing what to prioritize. Knowing what tools you have and, um, and using them. And uh, the whole thing about the Heritage Register is that it's a tool. It's, a, it's like a, if you're building a house and you don't have a hammer, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're missing something. You're, it's going to be a lot harder for you to do it. And, Heritage Register is, is a tool, one of many tools, which Jim touched on in his presentation. Knowing the rules of the game, knowing you know, what, what your limits are and uh, what you can push, and, and I think if you know the rules, it's far easier to, uh, to get those successes. Knowing what the best and most sustainable solutions are and so that everyone wins, and, and that's, um, for, for me, uh, where I try and, try and go, what, 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 how can we win? <laughs> And they win too. And, uh, and when you do that, in more likelihood, you're going you're gonna to end up with, with more wins. Learning from your failures, yes, you may have lost a building. But, um, but how, uh, you know, what, what caused that to happen? What were the, what were the root um, things that maybe, if you'd have done something differently, you, you might have had a different outcome? And it sounds like that's why we're here. You, this, the school that, uh, that you lost recently and some of the other amazing buildings that, um, and you know, it's, it's no point in just putting a memorial up and saying we lost a building and saying what, did we, what happened and let's not let that happen again. And celebrating your success. <clears throat> and um, it, it's, it's easy to fall into that trap when you do lose an amazing building like the Board of Ed, Ed building and, and just think really bad about what's, what, what's, what's going on in Heritage. But, um, but you're doing a lot of really good things here in Hamilton, and, and Jim touched upon them. Uh, you know, the Lister Block, uh, it's a post office in Dundas, and some of the great little main streets that, that you've got. And uh, it's important never to lose sight of that, because it's, it's a real hard slog working in Heritage. And if, you, and if you're just thinking negatively, it's going to be harder for you to, to sustain that effort through the tough times. And I think really take the time to celebrate what you've done, done really well. I'm new to Hamilton, I live in Waterdown, and uh, you know, it's, it's really opened my eyes to, the, to some of the really great, great heritage and buildings and things that you have around here, and uh, I'm proud to call it my home. So heritage planning in a municipal planning environment, and that's, that's the other thing that you have to, to look at, is that all the competing interests, and you see, Heritage is, is just, just one of them. 
Um, but again, if you understand how everything fits together, um, solutions can come about. I'm the director of planning in Grimsby, um, which is our neighboring municipality. We are in Niagara region, but we, we sometimes feel that we're a little bit closer to here in terms of our uh, cultural affinities. And um, it's a community with a very rich heritage. I'm uh, the director of planning, as was mentioned, and uh, heritage is, is a big part of what we um, want to achieve in terms of our community. It's not heritage for heritage's sake, it's heritage because it's, it's part of uh, maintaining the, the great uh, livable community and beautiful environment that we have in Grimsby, and heritage just happens to be a part of that. Heritage is also part of our economy. It's, it's part of why people want to come and visit and, uh, and enjoy the beautiful places that we have there. And so it's, it's again, it's not just a nice thing, it's something that's fundamental to, uh, to uh, economic, uh, economic health. We're, we're doing designations. We're one short of Jim's list, unfortunately. And uh, we're, we have a register, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about that. It's not 100% complete, but it's they've got most of their buildings of interest on the register. We have a facade improvement program for our downtown and uh, that's really helping to improve the look of our uh, center area. We need to, to ensure compatibility. We participate in our own doors open and uh, if you're nearby in June, come to see the engagement at the 40. It's, it's like after the, the Battle of Stony Creek and it's another, I think, example of our shared history. And another bit of our shared history that I'm, I'm really proud of was uh, the revival of the Hamilton, Grimsby and Beamsville electric railway that we did for Doors Open. We, we got a trolley essentially and we ran it along the old route which was number eight and uh, it was a great way of showing that heritage is more than just bricks and mortar. It's, it's, it's really um, the stories and, and, and experiencing in, uh, community in different ways and uh, maybe that's something we can partner with you on in the future. It was a really great success. <clears throat> It's your heritage too. <clears throat> we we en engage youth uh, through our heritage art contest, and that's really very vitally important. I mean, so I, I, I was one of the founding members of the Brampton Historical Society, and I'm I'm still one of the youngest members of that society. And 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 we have to engage our our youth um, to to show them what why we why we care about it so much, and why it's so important to to their futures and. Uh, because they're the people that are going to be owning heritage buildings, going to be championing heritage buildings in the future. And uh, it may seem like a simple thing, doing little art contests and all that sort of thing, but it's so essential in raising awareness. Um, heritage plaques, uh, interpreting history and natural environment. We're restoring our Carnegie building. But um, one of the things that we're... we're working on as well as a way of, of enhancing our abilities in, in heritage conservation is using cultural heritage landscapes. Taking those inventories of individual little buildings and seeing how, how they and the trees and the shapes of the roads and the landscape all works together. And I think for us that's helping us set priorities, showing meaning to why a particular building is important, not just as an individual piece. And it's, we're still very early days in this, but uh, Grimsey Beach is another area that we're looking at uh, defining as a cultural heritage landscape. But you can see how all these different layers, like number eight highway is one of the areas that we're looking at as a, a cultural landscape. And uh, you know, it's crossing by the, by the as it's, uh, well as it's tracks, track bed. And you see the, the multiple layers of history are just in and traveling along that road. And, uh, and I think by doing that, we're showing how all these little pieces all fit together and uh, establishing priorities, establishing value and meaning. And um, so we're, we're not starting with designation and districts. And I think we, it, we re recognize that we have to educate and we have to get people involved. And by little baby steps, like sort of defining a cultural landscape, engaging the community in a non-threatening way, I think we're going to be uh, achieving some success in that area. So again, municipal heritage registers are definitely the most important tool in the, in the box. 
And uh, I've, my heritage career, I think, has, has spanned both sides of having a register and not having a register. And uh, I remember being a heritage advocate in Brampton in the early 90s. Before Jim arrived, they made everything good, again, for Brampton. But, uh, um, and just having um, buildings that were of interest and a developer would come and want to knock it down and, and then council would have a heart-wrenching debate at council and say, you know, we, should we designate? And, and, uh, and even if they did, if, if you had to get a notice published in the newspaper and then so that you'd, you'd have this race to demolish the building and it was just crazy. And, uh, and then the next thing in the Brampton Guardian, you'd see a councillor holding a couple of bricks and saying, well, isn't that, isn't that terrible? And uh, I don't know if it was me, but, but when, when the Heritage Act came along, to being, to being reviewed and, and renewed in the um, early uh, 2000s. Markham was one of the communities that were, where I was working, was one of the communities that were asked for, in, for input. And, and this was, the register was one of the things that we put forward. We said, you know, we've, you've got to stop this, this insanity. I mean, all you need in demolition. And um, it's been very, very effective. I mean, I think it, it really, you don't see any of those. Well, municipalities have adopted those registers. You don't see that unnecessary drama anymore. It's just about the buildings or the, or the cultural landscapes. And, uh, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, and it's, and it's only 60 days. So, um, the, again, these are the, the areas of, of protection. Um, some places have li listings, but with no... no Heritage uh, Act, there's individual designations, heritage districts, and again, there's the register. And um, how, you, um, how you do it is fairly simple. You just need a council resolution, and, the, and, and, and then it's on, on the list. And uh, the reason it's so simple, again, is because the implications are, are so, so limited. There's no alteration review, there's no permanent demolition control. Um, it's, it's just a, a temporary delay. And um, there are many ways in which communities have, have gone around doing it. Um, when I was in Aurora, they just simply understood the, the, the minimum impact of the 60 days and simply passed a resolution converting their inventory over to a register and Markham uh, down the road had done, did exactly the same thing. It was relatively painless, and uh, that people would, if people were concerned, there was an opportunity for people to appeal, and 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 um, and so the community would evaluate the buildings and then make a recommendation to council if that could happen. Oakville, um, you know, the real estate market in Oakville is fairly hot, and and there was a concern that. Um, that they wanted to notify, but there was a concern that if they advanced notified people that they were considering being put on the register, that uh, you'd see a, a slew of, of demolitions of these buildings. And, uh, and so they created a policy that said, if we add buildings to the register, we will, it'll just go through council, and then we will do a formal notification. But what they also put in was a place, was a, a formal process of appeal, and a formal process for evaluating why a property should be on the register, and one of the reasons, one of the, the ways, um, the justification for putting a property on the register was to say, does this building or does this feature have the potential to meet any of the criteria under Ontario Regulation 0906? And there's nine criteria about cultural, historical, architectural sort of values, and. Uh, and so if we could say yes on, on the basis of preliminary research, it had that <clears throat> potential, then we would recommend to include it on the, uh, on the register. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not really, a, I haven't really been a big fan of really um, sort of categorizing build, buildings as A's and B's and C's and really um, making a permanent so the status of a building without really doing a full set of research because in, invariably, if you, if you just do a windshield survey and say that building's an A, you're gonna miss something and then, you, and then you, it's gonna be far more difficult when you discover that some, someone significant lived there or did something there to change that. Um, so it's far best to leave it as sort of a preliminary um, 
status in order to include it on the register and then do further research to really quantify what it's about. And so Oakville adopted their register and um, we had, we had an, a number of calls, a number of requests for removal, but they added 390 or so properties and I think there was probably only about maybe 15 to 20 um, requests for removal over the next couple of years, which we would do a, a formal research title search, uh, architectural analysis, and, uh, and make a recommendation and consider the context of, of you know, where the uh, owner's concerns were, were coming from. I've been through a process in Brampton where they were, um, before the Heritage Act was, was changed, just, just to add properties to, to a, a, an inventory that had no status other than just a list. And at that time, the Council of the Day required notification and public meetings in advance of adding buildings to the register. And uh, Brampton was on the verge of going from 230 odd thousand to 500,000 in terms of a population. And so, you know, it, it was, uh, there's a lot of, lot of investment. And fair enough, that's, that's, um, that's what, um, you know, it's part of, part of society to have investments, but there was a lot of concern about that. And in the end, because of the public backlash, council never, it took them a decade until Jim came along for them to even adopt the inventory. And um, without having an endorsed inventory at the very least, it, it left Brampton's heritage very, extremely weak. And, uh, and buildings were, were coming down and, and we were losing significant assets. It was only when we started potentially losing assets like Alderley Mansion of, of major significance that uh, the flag went up and it was like, well, maybe, maybe there's another way. And, uh, and Brampton got on that, that path of another way of um, but bringing in the tools to con that it needed to conserve heritage. And, um, and you know, it's look uh, from the outside looking in now at Brampton, I see a community that's that's grown, that's developed, that's prosperous, that has um, a, uh, a very diverse c community, and and the way heritage is 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 situated there, that is that it, it really helps provide a touchstone for history and culture and interest in in these neighbourhoods that, that make them far more livable and beautiful places. About uh, five minutes or so, Michael, please. Okay, I'm just wrapping up. And uh, again, there's many things that you can include on a register. And uh, again, use your failures to your advantage. Learn from them. This is my summary. Sorry, I'm just flicking through. Hold on. My conclusions. Again, know your tools and use them. Ensure objectivity in building evaluation process. Be proactive, be consistent, educate. Um, state the benefits of conservation. Establish clear, effective official plan policies and establish user-friendly heritage policies. Consider heritage resources early in the planning process. And um, again, heritage is such a key component of a healthy community. Heritage and development can work together, as it's seen many times here in Hamilton. And the tools are available to create a successful heritage program and develop. But they only work if you use them. And uh, if you do show that heritage matters in your community, the developers will take notice. And uh, people, have, and I like to say, finish off with, no community has ever regretted saving a beautiful historical building and, and place. I had someone that says, yes, they did somewhere, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can count like multiple that, that hasn't. So that, conclu conclu that um, concludes my presentation. If you have any questions later, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. And our uh, next speaker is uh, Jeff Feswick. Uh, Jeff is the principal of Astoria Building Restoration Inc. and uh, Kathy Wakefield from uh, Stony Creek and Municipal Heritage Committee. A few words, thanks.
Jeff Beswick is the president of Historic Historia Building Restoration, Inc., specializing in historic and commercial building restoration and renovations for the past 24 years. Historia Restoration is an award-winning restoration company serving the Toronto through Hamilton corridor. Mr. Feswick is a former president of the Hamilton Halton Construction Association and member of the board of directors for over 10 years. Jeff has also served as a member of the board of directors for the Council of Ontario Construction Associations and served on the board of directors for the Toronto Construction Association. Prior to regional amalgamation, Jeff served as chairperson of the Dundas Heritage Advisory Panel. He was also a member of the Hamilton Heritage LACAC and served as a board member of the Bay Area Arts and Heritage Stabilization Program. Jeff has taken an active role as a community volunteer and patron of the arts, serving as past co-chair of the 2006 Trillium Dinner at Leuna, a committee member of the Bay Area Science and Engineering Competition since 2005, chair of the King William Art Walk Committee, and recently served as the chairperson of the Hamilton Arts Council. In December 2010, Jeff purchased the historic Treble Hall building and Pagoda building at the corner of King and John in the downtown core of Hamilton. And his company, Historia, is in the process of restoring it to its former glory. I have to add a personal note here. I have pictures here of my mother's graduating class at Treble Hall for the Waddington School of Music in 1947. And if you want to see it when we're done, I would love to share it with you. Jeff's most recent purchase, the Traguno, Traguno building located at 126 Catherine Street North, will be repurposed from a four employee warehouse to a 40 employee state of the art office facility. Please welcome our very own Jeff Feswick. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Kathy. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, start by thanking Brian McCaddy for asking me to even speak here today. It's a thrill to be here. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank everybody in the room, because uh, obviously the people in this room are the people who do care and are the people who can help make a difference uh, to uh, the built heritage that we have in Hamilton and area. And uh, we want to see that saved, obviously. Um, as it was uh, uh, mentioned by Kathy, back in 2010, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to purchase a building in Hamilton, uh, Trouble Hall, in the Pagoda Building. And uh, shortly after I purchased that building, we got a little bit of press, and I suddenly received uh, all kinds of uh, cards and emails, and, and uh, uh, even as, as much as uh, flowers and such came, came to me, and uh, uh, thanking me for, for buying the building. And I was uh, obviously thrilled. I, you know, I didn't expect it. I didn't see any of that coming. And it, it gave me time to think about it a little bit, and I, I realized that I wasn't really being uh, thanked for buying it, I was really being thanked for saving it. And that was really the key, and I think that's what we're here today to talk about more than anything else, is like really saving these things. It's, it's one thing to buy them, it's another whole thing to save them and do something with them. And uh, what I recognized by saving that building is I was saving and, and, and the people were thanking me for saving art, culture and history. And that's really what we're doing when we're doing that with buildings. We're, we are saving and retaining our art, our heritage and our culture in our, in our, uh, in our city here. Scientific America, which is a, a, a published magazine, uh, mentioned a, a, few, a, few, a couple of years ago now that we have a brighter future and they've seen it and it is urban. And we have to keep that in mind that we, we have now become a, a culture who are recognizing the importance of, of our urban cores and we have to you know, maintain these things. They're, they're, they are so crucial to everything that we are and everything that we will be. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time today talking primarily about <coughs> adaptive reuse of buildings, also uh, creative architectural additions that we're, we're fortunate to be seeing uh, being built onto and within buildings that we have within our community. And also a little bit, I'll show some examples of, in, of intensification, which is a little off topic perhaps, but I'll, I'll try to keep, keep everything within tight. So, you know, we've got a big crowd here today and I, I really appreciate everyone who's come here. 
Um, and I think the best way to uh, maybe maybe uh, get a, get an idea of, of the cultural landscape that I'm referring to here is if we all jump onto one of those big uh, uh, accordion buses, maybe a, a double story one because there's a lot of people here, and uh, we're going to do all that right now. I'll drive it so everybody's safe. Don't worry about a thing. And we're going to start off, and we're going to take a trip into. Let's see where we're going to go. There it is, Dundas. So welcome to Dundas on our bus trip. And on, in Dundas, which is an interesting little town, and arguably the most beautiful little town in all of southern Ontario, can you imagine that town if instead of restoring and readapting the buildings, if we tore them down and built new ones? I mean, there's a, a typical landscape, streetscape, cultural landscape of Dundas, beautiful little town. They've been very smart in their, in their, uh, in their planning. Uh, we can't say that for every city, and there's been a lot of mistakes made. Dundas seems to have it put together pretty good, and I think we can use them as an example. Here, here's an example of an armories that was taken over by the Dundas Lions Memorial Club, or Dundas Lions Club, and created a community centre. A uh, fantastic place that the whole community is able to use now. Uh, right across the street from that, if you're familiar with Dundas, I think most of us are, we have a Victorian home which instead of demolition was turned into retail. Uh, again, when we're, when we're talking about that list of all these buildings that are uh, vulnerable, let's keep in mind that you know a house doesn't have to be a house necessarily. A house can be a retail, it can be all kinds of things. Uh, and I'll show examples of that as we go through. Uh, this is an older slide, of course, if you're familiar with the Dundas Valley School of Art. Fantastic, uh, even back in those days, it, it, back those days, a year ago, <laughs> year and a half ago. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it was a school, at one time a factory, uh, has had a complete uh, renovation and facelift. Looks fantastic, even better than it does in this photo. Uh, however, uh, the point is, here's a building that rather than tearing it down and building a new school, they've actually taken an old factory and made it far more interesting. Uh, you know, rather than something new, they've created something out of this old building. In the very background there, I guess I can use the pointer, I think that shows up there. Is it? Yeah. There's a, a condo, one of the first condos that was sort of a, a, a reuse, if you're familiar with that building. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, big, a better picture than that, but I think you get the idea. Uh, let's go down and get, jump back in the bus, and we're going to head up the street to Hamilton, where we've got some real good examples as well. So I'm, I'm not here to slay Hamilton. I think Hamilton's done some great things. Uh, I have a few examples of things that maybe weren't great, but let's, let's move along. So we're on Main Street, and we're heading down, and here we are in Hess Village. And uh, Hess Village is a very unique area. Uh, a little strip of Hamilton, which are nice homes, could have easily been clear cut. Rather than that, somebody had the idea, and I think it was inspired by uh, Yorkville in, in Toronto, to let's make this into an area that can have uh, restaurants and some galleries and such. Since then, it's been taken over a little bit by a club scene. And uh, you know what they say, if, you're, if it's too loud, you're too old. So we're gonna keep moving. <laughs> Here's a, here's a building that we love a lot. Uh, I, I mean, I love a lot. I hope everyone in this room loves a lot. The old federal building. I, I've got a short story to tell you about this one. Uh, I guess two years ago now, uh, I was asked to speak at the uh, Hamilton Economic Summit. And uh, I was uh, thrilled to be able to speak at it and, and uh, accepted the uh, position and found out that I would be speaking alongside of a developer, actually sharing the stage with uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Darko Vranich. And uh, Darko had recently, just prior to this uh, summit, uh, applied for and was granted a demolition permit for this building. And uh, that didn't sit too well with me. And I thought, boy, I've got to share a stage with this guy. What on earth do we have in common? What am I going to be able to talk you know, on the same stage with this fella? Didn't know him at all, but I gave him a phone call anyways, uh, literally the day before, and uh, got on the phone with him and said, Mr. Vranich, he said, call me Darko. I said, okay, Darko, I would like to uh, get together with you. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what we're going to do uh, tomorrow in the economic summit. He, he was acceptable to that. He said, meet me at my hotel, which is the Sheraton. I met him at the Sheridan. I went through a few things, and I said, you know, we don't have a lot in common, and right now I just bought Treble Hall, and the city sort of has put me on some kind of a pedestal, and I'm a bit of a white knight, and you're a little bit of a dark horse, and I'm not sure how we're going to work this together, but what can we do? And, and, and are you sure you want to tear down that building, you know? And I remember when I was a little kid, I went in there with my mother, and, and there was a man there who directed us to the elevators, and you know, he pushed the button for us, and it, it was something that was part of my past, and I really wish you didn't have to tear that down. And he said, have you got a little bit of time? I said, I, I, I do, Mr. Branich. He said, you call me Darko. I said, okay. <laughs> he goes, let's go to my office. 
we went to his office, which was just up the street on King Street. In his office, there was about five men in there. And he pulls out a, a architect's rendering of uh, what he was planning on doing. And I said, well, that's, that's nice, I, nothing against it, but it really, it, it's unfortunate you have to tear down the building. He pulled out another one and he said, this is what I was going to do. He goes, but I was talked out of it. He goes, I think I'd like to do this again. And it was a picture of saving this building. <clears throat> I said, honestly, if you can save this building, this would be incredible. Could we make an announcement tomorrow at the economic summit? He said, I think we can do that. So the following day at the economic summit, he wasn't there, but he sent his representative, Tyler, one of the men in the room, and uh, Tyler got on stage and, and announced that, yes, in fact, they were going to uh, save this building. And I, I held up Tyler's arm in, in the air, and I said, so we can say we're going to save a big, a big portion of the federal building. And he said, yes, we can say that. And uh, it was a photo op, cameras are going off, and he got a big, big round of applause for that. And today, once again, there's the Elizabeth Holden uh, relief uh, sculptures, which are fantastic. Thankfully, they're, they're being saved along with the building. This is something what it looks like today. And yes, we've lost a big piece of it, but we've saved such an important piece. And, and some people have had said to me since then that they've heard this story or they, they, they see it and they go, well, really, is it that important of a building? And it's like, yeah, damn right it is. This is a federal building. There's only three in Hamilton. This was built well. It's a great building. Uh, imagine the same lot torn down completely and all new buildings. Then imagine this being part of what we're doing and building these other ones around it. And when we're driving down Main Street, you'll still get to see this. This is still part of what we have. And I think it's so important that we think about this when we're looking at taking down buildings or keeping buildings. You know, we keep a piece of it. I'm not, I don't want to be so arrogant to say, hey, everything has to stay exactly the way it is. Is, but boy, if we could do at least this much, it's a fantastic step in the right direction in every case. And you know, Mr. Vranich, I call him Darko now, he, he tells me, you know, these are the kind of things, he, he gets a, a bad rap and maybe, you know, properly, I, I don't want to say one or the other, but it's awfully nice to see him saving this. And I have to think that if Darko will save this, perhaps other developers will do the same thing if we get in their ear and really ask them to do it. And really, you know, maybe that's what it takes more than anything else. And, you know, just be one-on-one -on -one with these guys and say, what can we do about it? Here's a uh, example of uh, infill. Uh, this was a vacant lot for a long time. Uh, and they built the uh, Staybridge uh, uh, Hotel, which is a reasonable hotel, a bit of a, a tear down at some point in time, I suppose, but it's certainly serving its purpose right now for hotel space in Hamilton. Carrying our bus trip up the road, here we go. Uh, this is again a little bit older, but this is the new Hilton that they're building. Uh, I've taken all these pictures because we're kind of coming up here. I'm not trying to sell the uh, Vranich, uh, you know, developers here. This happens to be three buildings in a row that all happen to be theirs. And not a terrible building. It's got a few issues and, and you know, we could talk about that. That's a different topic altogether. But again, something that's being done within the city that is uh, not the worst thing in the world. Carrying on, look where we are here, and, and I think uh, I've seen Diane Dent come in, and uh, Barbara, and, uh, we, we've got all these people here with us today. I think, Donna, you were on the LACAC as well when I was a few years ago, and I remember uh, one of the councilmen in the room, and myself, and, and these three ladies, and a number of others with us, and uh, Robin, I think you were there too. Uh, I suggested that the city hall be designated. And uh, the councilman said, why on earth would you designate this building? Really slaying it, like saying this is one of the worst buildings ever built in the city. We have to replace it. And it was around the time we were starting to, the whispers about replacing City Hall. And I said, well, geez, you know, I think I can name quite a few reasons why we should save it. You know, Stanley Roscoe de designed it and, and uh, it, it's got a footprint that can accommodate a tower in the back and it's uh, a, a perfect example of uh, international style architecture. And you know, I went on for a few other things and the, the following meet, meeting, uh, Diane passed, a, uh, uh, passed the, the ruling that uh, the building was gonna be designated. And uh, here we are standing in it today. And although it may not be everyone's dream of the perfect building, I'll tell you, in 20 years from now, I don't think anyone will complain that we saved this building and here it is and you know we're all still in it it's got the beautiful mosaics and it's it's still got the you know all the things that it had before nothing has really been destroyed at all and it's only better and I hope that most of the people in the room will agree and again if you don't agree today I'm pretty sure you'll agree in 20 years <laughs> we're gonna keep driving up the street figure out how to work a mouse there it is there's one there's a sad sight 
Uh, what happened there? You know, we didn't get in the right ear. I guess that's what happened there. Um, McMaster University, City of Hamilton, and um, Board of Education. I mean, these are three institutions we should be looking at, looking to for inspiration on how to do things. And those are the three parties that are sitting around the table who decided, for one reason or another, that this building was going to get torn down. Um, I don't know how everyone in this, feel, in, this, in this room feels about this building, but I think most of us would agree it was a damn shame. Here is what they're building, and hey, you know what, it's kind of a picture off the thing, I'm sure it'll look straighter. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not bad, it's okay. I don't want to say it's a terrible building. My only argument is, why did we have to knock down a building in order to build another building? Couldn't we have figured out a way to use the one that was already there and maybe found another space for the other one? You know, and when we're talking about these buildings that we want to save, let's keep those things in mind too. There is a lot of infill that we can, that we can fill in if we want to build something new. Can we not just save them? And sometimes we have to mothball them even and not use them for a few years. And if that's the worst case scenario, uh, it's got my support. There's the, uh, the property basically right now. And uh, yeah, good. I'm glad to see something going on, I suppose. Better than a vacant lot, now they tore it down. We've seen that before. I don't know if anyone recognizes this location here. This to me is a bit of a crying shame. I don't know if anyone recognizes it. I'll show it to you what it looked like about six months ago. That was it right there. Yeah, that's a damn shame, isn't it? You know, we lost something that really, I think a lot of us have a lot of heart and soul attached to that darn place. And uh, there it is, you know? I'm just gonna, just for, for a fact, there it goes. <laughs> yeah, that's a shame, you know, so, for so many reasons on so many levels. However, what's done is done. Jump back in the car, I digress. Uh, if we want to look at good examples in Hamilton, because we really don't want to talk about all the, the negative things, I know we don't. Uh, Unified Family Court, one, at one time was the original uh, library in Hamilton. Fantastic uh, uh, adaptive reuse that we have right there. And uh, those are the sort of buildings that we have to look at. And Main Street is full of them. And actually, Hamilton is full of them. We'll carry on down Main Street a little bit further. We get to the Four Corners, and most people know what I mean by the Four Corners, King and Main, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, Main and James. And we have the Piggott Building, Hamilton's first skyscraper. Uh, doesn't look too, it's not scraping too many skies, but it's still, it's a, it's a gorgeous building. And it is now condominiums right across the corner from that. Again, a quick story back when, in the days of LACAC. I remember I was just getting involved in this, and, and this building at the time, it had been vacant for a while. It was obviously the Bank of Montreal originally, vacant for a while. Uh, a, a group came along, I don't know the interests, and I don't, you know, I don't know who, who was involved, but it became a Monopoly nightclub. And uh, I remember hearing people talking about, uh, geez, they painted the door purple, and I, I know there's loud music coming out of there at nighttime, and I thought, geez, you know, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, they didn't tear the building down, it's still standing there, and today, it's now the Gowling's Law Offices, and it's now actually called the Gowling's Building. And, and you know, it's a building that was saved. Thankfully, it was saved. I'm not sure who had something to do with it. I wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, Dr. Dent in the back there had something to do with it, because she seems to have her finger in most of these things. And, and thankfully, it was saved. And, you know, there's a building that we can say nothing except for it's a perfect example of uh, adaptive reuse in our city and one of the most beautiful buildings within our city as well. Running right across the street there, we had the uh, first landed bank, which was uh, uh, office, offices now, and uh, fantastic. And imagine if we'd lost that building throughout the, you know, the years. Thankfully, there were enough people who saw use in saving it and managed to save that. Just up the street a little further, we hit the, uh, the old courthouse, which is now McMaster University, has uh, fortunately uh, used that for, uh, for their, uh, for their um, continued education, I believe the building is used for, and being maintained, being used every day of the week. It's a, a great example once again. Right across the street, the old post office. This is an interesting building because they've, they've I talked earlier about a, a, you know, architectural adaptation, uh, taking a building and maybe it's not big enough, maybe it's not the right size, maybe something's not right about it. Okay, let's get some architects with some vision. What can we do with it? So here they did, they built this big chunk onto it and geez, you know, it, it's hard to tell really what was the old stuff and what was the new stuff. But if you look at the cornerstone, 1998. You know, the rest of it was built, I think, in 1927 or thereabouts. That's this, this whole piece here. And they did a fantastic job. I, I don't know if it's won awards, but that, that thing should be winning awards. It's one of my favorite buildings in that example of what 
could have been torn down because it wasn't big enough, wasn't being used properly. Instead, it's uh, the John Sopinka Courthouse and uh, really uh, an absolute gorgeous jammy in Hamilton. Tip Top Taylor Building, now we're in Toronto just to give you an idea of what we can do. This was uh, one of the first condo, uh, uh, what do we call that, when they, when they re reuse a condo or reuse a factory and turn it into condos, they built up onto it. And we have a good example of that here in Hamilton, which is the Witten Lofts. And, you know, we're talking about a, uh, Sanford School as we speak. Uh, you know, the ball's tearing that sucker down. And it, you know, it practically makes me cry up here, quite honestly. And we look at this, and we had some developers with some vision. And thank God they, that we do. Uh, a couple of guys, St Steve Kolkowski and uh, Dave Solvay. And this is what they're creating instead. And, you know, they've saved that school. And they've created a place for people to live. It's got fantastic views. There's not a thing you can say bad about it, I don't believe. I, I mean, I love what they're doing. I love what they've done. You know, last level suite start at 299 <laughs> Here, here we have here we have one of my absolute favorites, uh, the Royal Connaught. Uh, everybody, I'm pretty sure, has to be aware of that. I, I talk about that to anybody. Everyone seems to have some kind of a story. You know, it was where they had their wedding pictures taken, or it's where they had their whatever. It doesn't matter. Everyone knows the building, loves the building, and uh, recently announced that uh, it's going to have uh, some work done to it, become condos as well, which is a fantastic, you know, uh, a happy story for the city of Hamilton. Who could be happier than, than myself? Because right across the street is my building, which we were talking about uh, a little bit earlier. B bought that a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I, I, all I can say about my building is that that uh, it, when I bought it, it was in in a, a state of. Uh, of, of you know, terrible state. Uh, it needed uh, so much work done to it. Um, I wasn't afraid, to, afraid of it. This was the building about, well, that was how it looked the day I bought it. And you can see the condition of the windows, I mean, the, and the condition of the whole building. It, it had been neglected for 50 or 60 years. So, you know, you look at a building, and it doesn't mean just because it's been empty for a while that it can't be purchased, can't be reused. Um, uh, a building like that is uh, a perfect example of it. Here it is about six or so months later. We put a big art display across the front of it, and it was kind of an interesting, uh, I, I felt it was, uh, uh, um, message uh, saying that, you know, if, if, if anyone happened to go by it at the time, uh, those window uh, coverings, we had to cover them for, for other purposes. And so we decided, well, rather than just cover them, let's put a message up there for the people. And what it said really was that uh, anybody with buildings in this condition, uh, you know, are showing disrespect not only to the buildings but to the people who are working and living and visiting our city. And, uh, you know, it's a damn shame. I want to show you the inside of the building. That's what it looked like when I bought it. And uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty gruesome, quite honestly. Uh, most people ran away from that building, and luckily I, I came along and, and saved it, I guess. There's another picture of the interior. So, the, you know, this is the condition, and I don't know if you know, anyone here is considering purchasing something or if, if you're going to be involved in some way of trying to help save some of these buildings that are on this list. I know they're not all in this condition, but for anyone who is, you know, don't look at it and think that, oh, that's beyond repair. There, there, there's, there's almost no such thing as beyond repair. You know, and here's a perfect example of it. We, we decided to do something called uh, sort of deconstruction rather than demolition. So we took it apart very slowly and uh, we sort of, we were fortunate, we found a lot of articles in there that otherwise would have just been demolished and thrown in the garbage. We uh, managed to save them. Uh, some pretty, pretty cool things really, museum quality. This is an old bottle built here in Hamilton. You know, I mean, a number of things that were really, um, you know, some of the coolest things I've ever found in, in our construction days and uh, quite happy to uh, have, have had, had a chance to save those things. Um, let me see what we have next on our list here. Here's an example of what I'd, I'd like to do with the building ultimately, and we're kind of working towards that right now. Um, since I bought the building, I have a, a small list here. We, on the John Street, John and King Corner there, we have uh, two new art galleries, three buildings that have been bought off of absentee landlords, two new coffee shops, one future music store, one new bicycle shop, two new restaurants and one future restaurant. Now that's within two years. That's what's happened since I bought that corner. So, you know, we got to keep this in mind that we have a dilapidated corner-like 
King and John, and it's got so much potential. And as people are moving more into the city, we've got to recognize that, and I, I know we do. And, and the people here, you know, I, I really look forward to what we can all do. Uh, this is an example of uh, something we did, which was uh, one of the, 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 the um, storefronts we had, and uh, we built a cafe, one of the cafes I referred to a minute ago, um, called the Moulin Rouge. And again, showing sort of the before and after, this is what it looked like before we started construction. And this is what it looks like today. You know, that's, exact, that's that room. That room is that room. And that room is that room. You know, so, geez, you know, it's, it's not like it can't be done. So, I, I, you know, I beg of you all, get the message out that we don't have to tear things down to, to make things better. We can take what we had and, and turn it on. There's my building today. That's within the last few months anyways. And, I mean, if you look at the windows now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> not, not necessary, but thank you very much. And, you know, we have got one last picture here. I know we have to wrap up here. This is uh, something we decided to do just uh, uh, kind of for the community more than anything. And it's uh, an art piece that we, we uh, uh, had a, an artist come in and, and do for us. We call it in, in, the, in the Garden of Eden or in the Garden of Vida. Uh, I was recently approached by a girl who uh, had another idea with the alleyway. And she wants to put a vertical garden in the uh, alley and uh, build something up there. And I think, geez, you know how many great ideas can come out of us? You know, just keep them coming because it, it's fantastic to get them and to hear them. And I personally will entertain any idea I hear and I will try to do anything I can. So this may go from in the Garden of Eden to in the vertical Garden of Eden. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this is what we start with. This is the Gore Park. And, you know, great cities start from the core and work out. And I think that that's what we have to get in our heads. You know, we're not necessarily, you know, obviously suburbs are important and we need to continue those, but we need to start right here in the center and we got to build ourselves out. We got to save these buildings, you know, and save our cultural landscape. It's just too important to take it lightly. Another picture of the Gore, just, you know, it's a beautiful city. I was recently in San Francisco and, and honestly, of course, I can't compare Hamilton today with San Francisco, but I can completely compare Hamilton with San Francisco if we have a, bit of, a little bit of vision and just look at it like, what could this city be? So please, you know, let's, let's make this happen. Uh, one just last, real fast, we spoke about the Trigano building. Here's sort of a, in the process of taking down the cladding. On the left-hand side, this is how it looked when we bought it. It was covered in, in, a, in a steel cladding. This was in the process of removing it. All of a sudden, whoa, lo and behold, we got all these beautiful windows up there. And within the next two weeks, I think it is, those are going to be replaced with nice new heritage looking windows. The whole building is uh, getting a, a complete rebuild. Here's the interior. Like who would have thought, we, you know, th these beams and posts in there that are, you know, in, in some case, cases almost 20 inches by 20 inches solid wood. It's just gorgeous. Um, unfortunately, we weren't ready for doors open this year. Next year we will be for sure. And I, I invite anybody here to, to, you know, come over and have a look at it, whether it's during, uh, you know, as I said, it won't be open doors open, but it, it's kind of open all the time. So if you, if you happen to come by, it is a construction site, but um, I'd be more than happy to give anyone a tour to see what, what we're doing over there. Just another example of the interior. And it, you know, it went from a, a, a company, a, a, seed, a little seed factory that employed four people. I understand that two people were unfortunately laid off and two people were transferred. Um, when we're finished, this is my partner Dave Premi and myself, when we're finished with this thing, it's going to house at least 40 people. And those 40 people will be in like, quite honestly, the coolest space they could possibly work in. It's going to be really, really nice. So anyways, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for listening to me. And thank you again, Brian. Thanks very much, Jeff. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Kayla Jonas Galvin from the Heritage Resources Center at the University of Waterloo. And she's been working on a number of things, but uh, today I'm going to speak about the uh, Building Stories program, which may provide us with a, a tool to, uh, to actually catalog, to inventory some of those buildings on the list that we're, we've been talking about this morning. Kayla? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I've got uh, Rob Hamilton. Uh, Rob is the uh, past president of the ACO Hamilton branch. I'll, um, I'll just take a moment here and just to, to recap some of the comments that have made uh, so far this morning uh, and, and underscore the importance of this tool that 
to potential to, for us to, to move ahead with. Um, and what we need to do to get more uh, properties on the register of uh, properties of historical, architectural and historical interest. Um, I'll remind everyone that the city of Hamilton has been unified since 2001. So this has been an issue that we've been dealing with for 12 years. Uh, Bill 60, the new Ontario Heritage Act, received royal assent in April of 2005, which uh, gave us the 60-day power, uh, again underscoring the need to have this second tier register. Um, I'll also remind everybody in the audience, although it's not been raised here today, but it certainly has been uh, raised by me with the politicians um, in private, that designated properties in Hamilton represent less than one-tenth of one percent of all privately held properties in Canada and are no threat to property, uh, private property holders in this city. Um, as well, uh, Jim noted in his presentation that since 2008, Hamilton has failed to designate a single property. Designation is not a threat to the value of properties. In fact, it's quite the reverse. Um, experts like New York-based architect Dr. Anthony Tung, author of Preserving the World's Great Cities, has pointed this out. In May of 2004, at the first joint conference held in Hamilton, and ironically enough at the Connaught Hotel shortly before its closure, of the first conference of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario and Community Heritage Ontario, uh, called Advocating for Adaptive Reuse, Creating a Culture that Values Our Heritage Buildings, Neighbourhoods and Landscapes, Mr. Tung lectured to the delegates about the deconstruction or destruction of built heritage of 22 major cities from around the world and the extremely small percentage of built heritage that remains today relative to the number of new built constructions within any given community, Hamilton being no exception, and the net positive impact of preserving those that remain. Mr. Tong felt that matters were no less dire here in Hamilton after receiving a tour, which I participated in. It was a pleasure to host people who came from over 60 communities from across Ontario, as well as internationally, who were seeking positive economic cultural approaches to adaptive reuse, including the Ontario Minister of Culture, Madame Mayu, and her parliamentary assistant, MPP Jennifer Mossop, as well as the chair of the Ontario Heritage Foundation, the Right Honourable Lincoln Alexander. It was a pity that only one alderman and a handful of dedicated city staff bothered to attend that conference. Dr. Tung's observations are backed up by studies undertaken by Dr. Robert Shipley, with whom Kayla is an associate, working at the School of Planning, University of Waterloo. Among the reports uh, and studies undertaken by Dr. Shipley include the loss of heritage properties in Ontario, a study which was completed in 2002. And some of those findings included that Ontario communities continue to lose significant numbers of heritage buildings, and that has not abated. That we're now uh, 12 years beyond this. Uh, since 1985, 433 buildings had been lost in a sample of 22 communities alone. Some places had lost one in five of all of their historic buildings. Some places had lost over 200 times more heritage property buildings than any other type of construction. The places that have suffered the highest losses are, not surprisingly, among the municipalities with the greatest development pressure. So we've learned about that earlier today about uh, the levels of designation and those uh, communities that have properties on this second register. Um, with large communities, those being populations over 25,000, losing more heritage buildings than small places. Uh, the issues involved in renewal and re revitalization of Ontario's built heritage and heritage landscapes is not simple to explain nor resolve, and demolition is not a panacea for what ails us. Um, Kayla is going to be presenting us with a tool that may help us bring forth both our heritage properties and our second tier registered properties, bring them forward to uh, Hamiltonians in general and those from uh, afar. It's a very fascinating tool and I'll continue here. Um, Kayla has joined the Heritage Resource Centre in 2007. She has an honours BES in Environment and Resource Studies with a joint major in Anthropology from the University of Waterloo and has recently begun her Masters in Planning. At the Heritage Resource Centre, Kayla is involved in many projects, including work on the Historic Places Initiative. She acted as coordinator for the Heritage District Study for the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, which also included amongst these uh, areas were the studies conducted in the Crossville, uh, Cross Melville Heritage District, Dund Dundas, and the McNabb Charles District, uh, immediately behind City Hall and the compiling of the town of Halton Hills Heritage Register. She's also completed the Goderidge Harbour Cultural Heritage Landscape Study. In addition, she's been part of the team to help develop building stories, which she's going to talk about to you now. Now, thank you.
Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm here to talk about building stories, uh, which is a, hopefully a tool that you will find useful. What it is, is an online inventory for recognized as well as non-recognized historic places in Canada. So you might have heard that uh, about the Heritage Register, the Register of Canadian uh, Places for, in Canada, uh, or the Canadian Register, and that's only for designated properties. So properties that have already been formally recognized by the municipality. So this takes that one step further and allows those places that maybe aren't formally recognized but the community values as important uh, and gives some context to that. It is Canada-wide, so we have actually um, sites in every province and territory listed on this website. The goal when we developed this was for it to be used not only by municipalities and planning staff, but also by the public community groups and professionals. So try and get all those people that are working on heritage in all these different contests, one tool that they can all use. Um, and the website here is buildingstories.co, and yes it is .co. I, seems like every time I write something about it, someone emails me and asks me, are you sure it is .co? Um, yes, if you know the person who owns .ca or .com, they won't return my emails. <laughs> um, so it's .co, and I do have brochures outside on the tables in case you don't want to write all of this down. Uh, this is a joint effort, a joint venture, um, headed by the Heritage Resources Centre at the University of Waterloo, which is where I work. Um, we also have two technical partners. Um, I don't know how to make websites. I do know how to tell people how to make websites. Um, so we work with the Centre for Community Mapping, which is comap.ca, and we also work with the Computer Systems Group, which is another research centre in the university, but they deal with computer things. <laughs> um, so some of the benefits of this is that it's accessible online and it also has a mobile component. So most of the information that you put online can also be seen on the mobile app. Um, anyone can add a site. So anyone can go on and register. You have to be a registered member and add information about a site. So it's a way to crowdsource information about historic sites, which I think is what you're looking for. Um, it encourages public input and participation, first of all, not only by adding properties, so anyone can go on, you can go on today and add a property you think is important, but someone can also go on and add a comment after you've listed it. Uh, so the information that you add isn't static, you might not know everything about that building, so it creates a kind of conversation about it. Um, and there is also a tour option. So you can add individual buildings. Um, you can also add landscapes through a polygon instead of just a point. But you can also add tours. So those come up on the mobile as well. Um, and we've had a couple of communities use this for their doors open uh, tours, but also walking tours. We have quite a few up in Kingston from our last conference there. Um, you can add the information. So what does it look like? This is what it looks like. Um, and it has a variety of options, but basically you just sign in, register up at the top, and you can sign in to add buildings. Now the amount of information that's required for a building is actually quite minimal. You need the name of a building, if it has a name, the address, the municipality. You need to know what kind of recognition it has, if it's uh, designated, if it's just a historic structure. Um, you also need to upload an image. So this is all minimal information that would be required for somebody else to identify what that building is. So someone else could look at your entry and know what it is. The other thing is we require mapping, um, and so that is partly helps with the search function, so you can search by geographic area by zooming in on your map. It also helps with the mobile, because the mobile uh, all runs on the GPS. So after you've added the general information, you can technically submit your entry, you're done. But we do have the ability to add various other pieces of information. Um, so that you can enhance the entry, information that pe other people might find interesting. So we have a characteristics tab, and some of you who've been in Heritage for a while will recognize these icons. They're for, from the Canadian Inventory of Historic Buildings that were developed in the 1960s and 70s. And they were developed, these icons, for use by non-professionals, by volunteers, to get out and document their heritage in their community. And if you want to see all of them, they're in a giant filing cabinet 
it in Ottawa. Um, but it's a way of going through the building and learning if you don't know or categorizing if you do know some of the architectural features. So the building form, the wall, the roof shape, the window, the main entrance, the access and the property features. So once these are all clicked, you kind of have a basic description of what the architecture looks like. The next tab is a documents tab, and this is what I think is the most interesting part, is that you can add as many different documents as you want to the, this uh, entry. So you can upload both current and historic photos, as well as any kind of other documents, Word documents or PDFs, so if you have uh, early mapping, if you have technical drawings, if you have those inventory sheets that were done on typewriters that I know exist in so many municipal offices, they can be scanned and uploaded. You can also upload audios and video. So if you have an oral history interview or someone's done a presentation on that, or if you want to go out and film what it looks like with the neighborhood, any of these things can be uploaded as well. Uh, the last tab is the significance of the building. So we heard earlier that we've gone from kind of focusing on architecture to focusing more on values in heritage. So we've designed this tab to meet the standards or to, to mimic what we have in Ontario. So they're broken down by the three main categories found in Ontario Regulation 906, which is design, context, and historical. So each of those tabs has some kind of prompt to make you think about what might be important about the architecture. So so this has architectural style, the architect, and then a spot for notes on the design of the building. So if you know something about architecture or you found something written about that building, you can put it in here. It also does have a tab for a full statement of significance. So a statement of significance is normally done when a building is designated at the municipal level. Um, so if it does have that, you can just plop it right in there and that's all set up to act exactly like a statement of significance. So you can have both a statement as well as additional information added. Um, I guess I'll go back one. Once you're done all of these tabs, uh, you then submit it for review. Um, now these don't get put up automatically they have to go through a review process. Currently, most of them are reviewed by myself or one of my colleagues, and we don't necessarily fact check them, though we sometimes check to make sure that if it's designated or non-designated, but we make sure that there's nothing um, inappropriate written on it, or if you've uh, you know, given the current owner's name, that's something that you can't write in there. We do, however, have several municipalities that we've been able to delegate the authority for review to um, because we believe that the local people probably have the most local knowledge and you know all the dates and facts better than we could ever know them. Um, so we do have that ability to have de delegated authority to either uh, say a historical society or a municipality um, and then that means that before those entries are put up, they would be re reviewed at the local level. So everything that is reviewed gets, or everything that's submitted does get reviewed at some level. Um, and if a municipality or a community group wants to take on some of that ownership, um, then there's a button that you can click that says submit to, say the Hamilton Historical Society, or something like that. And we have to set that up at our end, so if that's something that you're interested in, we can talk about that later. Um, once you do have a, a, an approved entry, it's posted, and you can, uh, this is what the, the site detail looks like, and then I said you can make comments, so there's a comment section here. So you can not only type your comments, you can also upload additional documents. Um, so if you have, say, a historic photo because your family lived there, or you've done some additional research, you can also upload it on that comment section. So it gives you a, the ability to kind of layer information. I did mention that we do have a mobile app, um, and it's available on iPhone and BlackBerry and Android, and it's free for download. Um, and just, uh, it does three different things. So the first thing that it does is it browses the sites nearby. So it's gonna show you the 30 closest sites to you right now. Um, you can also browse tours nearby, so you can see by nearby walking or driving tours. 
And if you are a registered member, it also allows you to capture a site while you're out in the field. Uh, it's not the whole form, because that would be too much for you to type on your phone or me to type on my phone. So it's minimal information. It's the GPS coordinates, which come exactly from your phone, a picture, the address, and the municipality. And what it does is saves it as draft. So you can go back home and do the entry. So if you are out on site, you can do, say, 20 of them. Then you know what the address and the picture are. They're corresponding. You don't have to download them from your phone and all that kind of stuff so you can upload them. Um, so this is what the, the mobile app looks like. Um, this is the tour section so you can choose from any of these tours and it gives you a tour description as well as each of the individual places uh, as well as a map and the description. As well you can click take me there and it gives you directions on how to get there. Uh, or written directions if you don't want a map. So, as I mentioned, we do have sites from every province and territory on there, and we have over a thousand sites, um, and we've been live for just under a year now. Um, we have 19 tours, and we also have tours and sites in French. So it's a fully bilingual site. You can click at the top and click uh, French, and it will bring you to the French site. Um, the mobile app is also available in French. We have 327 registered members. Um, we recently had a commercial on old home television, and we've been featured in the Ontario Planning Journal, The Globe and Mail, and Municipal Worlds. And that is my contact information. Thanks uh, very much. That uh, sort of ends the formal speaker part of our uh, morning. And I want to thank people for, uh, for sitting uh, for so long. I, I uh, have the bad habit, I guess, uh, being a city councillor of not building breaks into uh, in today's like this, I'm used to sitting here for about eight hours at a time uh, through a general issues committee uh, meeting. And I know some of you have as well, waiting for particular items to come up or uh, having to listen to, uh, to us at city council. It's probably kind of painful at times. So thanks for your uh, patience. This, this next part, and I guess really the last part of the morning, I think is, is tremendously important because we've, we've got, uh, I hope at this point we're, we're inspired, we're, we're educated, we've learned uh, a variety of things. and. Uh, and uh, get a sense of the possible, uh, particularly from Jeff's uh, presentation and, and the experience from other municipalities and, and uh, across the province and the interesting tool that we've just seen from, uh, from the University of Waterloo. So at this point, I'd like to focus this back on the action part of, uh, of our interest here and, and to think again about this uh, municipal inventory uh, or list of, uh, of uh, cultural heritage uh, properties. And uh, as I say, there's about, uh, uh, there's about 7,000 properties on the list. About 1,000 are being tackled by city staff and a project for downtown, downtown Hamilton. Uh, but that leaves about 6,000 other properties that we, uh, that we haven't uh, translated into anything that the city can use to, to hopefully put up on, on the register. We heard from Michael the, the power of the register. Uh, and so that's what you need to do. So I, I think I perhaps wrongly keep referring to that we haven't done anything on this kind of stuff. In fact, that's not the case at all. The, uh, the area municipal uh, heritage societies uh, uh, through, the, uh, through Stony Creek and, and Glanbrook and Flamborough and Dundas and Ancaster and uh, Hamilton Mountain has a society as well. And then we've got the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario from a, uh, a Hamilton perspective, uh, maybe an old Hamilton perspective. Uh, they've been very active very active for years or, or probably decades for that matter, uh, compiling information on significant properties in their areas. So at this point uh, in the meeting, I'd like to invite uh, the groups up from the uh, various heritage, <coughs> excuse me, heritage societies to uh, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, what they have. We've got a list, it's got uh, 200 properties on it and here's what we know about them. Uh, 50 have disappeared and we, we know there's more out there we haven't we haven't come to yet, we haven't fully inventoried. Maybe we can use the, the tool that uh, uh, we just learned about uh, from Waterloo. So can I do that now then? I uh, invite uh, folks up from the society. Some of them are around the table here, I think. Some of them are up in the audience. So please come down and maybe speak uh, from the, uh, the podium here at the front. And we'll get a sense of uh, 
how much work are we talking about, these 6,000 properties? How much do we already know about? And how do we get that information in such a way that we can move it towards the, the register? Okay, who would like to start? Kathy from Stony Creek. Hi everybody, um, the list uh, on volume two, the, the inventory of buildings of architectural and or historical interest that came to the, the greater city um, at amalgamation time had 50 properties on it. <clears throat> Stony Creek has far more significant properties so we can certainly increase uh, the size of this list. But in going over this list with the uh, president of the Stony Creek Historical Society the other evening, we quickly uh, did Google and, and his memory, he's an amazing uh, amount of information. Um, we have established that whether the list was correct in coming from Stony Creek to the city, we don't know that. But of these 50 properties that are on this list currently on the city website, 50% of these properties no longer exist. So there's a massive opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, to add properties to this list. There's also a massive opportunity to correct this list. We have two people at our research and archives uh, office in Stony Creek, and we have a fabulous office there, lots of files. We have the opportunity now with Kayla's website to start putting correct information um, into, uh, onto this website and to correct this list. And that, that's a wonderful opportunity and we thank you. Thanks. Update, uh, who would like to go next? Uh, sure, from Hamilton Mountain. Yes, yeah, sure you can, yeah. <coughs> I'm Pat Saunders, and I'm uh, delegating myself to speak on behalf of the Hamilton Mountain Heritage Society. Uh, I'd like to think it's a very active um, heritage society, but we, we don't have a, a list of the properties, even though we've thought about it. Uh, currently, the uh, mountain properties that uh, we have concern with are, of course, Ockmar, Century Manor, and more recently, the Mohawk Trail School Museum. It's interesting that all of these buildings are owned either by municipal or provincial governments, so it makes it even more of a travesty that they're allowed to uh, sit and decline. Uh, as far as our history is concerned, as the new newest part of Hamilton, the, the mountain as such, uh, the boundary from when the line was established in 1846, when uh, that part of the mountain was included in the city of Hamilton. The boundary was the middle of a concession street or stone road in, and la remained there until 1929 when because of some health concerns the boundary had to go to uh, Fennel Avenue uh, and uh, th that didn't change until uh, 53 and then 63 and finally in 2000 uh, the whole part was taken over by amalgamation. So our history is really contained in our popular volume published first in 2000. This is a fifth reprinting of the book and gives you a real sense of how much we've already lost on the mountain and how we really have to do something uh, to preserve what's left. Uh, what I would propose is that in working on the task for today, uh, the, the inventory that uh, a society like the Hamilton Mountain Heritage Society be designated to be responsible for that uh, the list of the 6,000 visit properties that are on the mountain. And I would challenge my colleagues on the Hamilton Mountain Heritage Society to take on that task. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pat. So, and uh, Stan, uh, Stan Nowak from Dundas, Stan? Button. Yep. Testing. Okay. Um, again, my name is Stan Nowak. I'm a co-founder and a past president of the Dundas Valley Historical Society. We're, I guess, the new kid on the block. We've been around for less than uh, less than a decade. There was an original uh, Dundas Valley Histor or Dundas Historical Society, uh, which begat the Dundas Historical Society Museum, but the Historical Society passed away, and a bunch of us decided about ten years ago to get together and. Uh, 
uh, resurrect uh, another historical society for Dundas. As such, we've been more of an outreach group. We've presented uh, historical heritage presentations um, on local Dundas history. We've done some tours. We've contributed to publications like the Vanished Hamilton series that, uh, that's at the front desk here. And uh, we have not compiled an inventory at all of, uh, of any um, properties of Victor uh, architectural or historical significance. And uh, this is a big reason why I was really interested in this because I would like to get uh, the community of Dundas established and well on their way, hit the ground running to do something like this. I, we have about 200, uh, I think it's about 200 buildings of, um, uh, listed in the volume two of, um, of uh, the full title of what Kathy was calling it. <laughs> and uh, a few are of concern. There's, uh, there's one old uh, building, uh, uh, 2 Hat Street, that's a very, uh, very important part of our history. It's, it's not designated uh, at all, but it was, it's, one, it's the, definitely the oldest building in Dundas and uh, probably the oldest in Hamilton, depending on where you read, a, uh, or one of the oldest at least, depending on where you read your, your information spill between 1799 and 20, or, uh, 1805. Uh, there are some buildings I know that are not on that register now, uh, either by cause of demolition or, uh, or, or fire or uh, some other uh, misfortune. Um, so I'd, um, I'm really uh, glad that, that we had this presentation. I'd like to thank uh, Councillor McHattie and everybody else on our Heritage Committee uh, for putting this together. This is well overdue. Uh, we should have done this ages ago, but better late than never, I guess. So I hope we can really get together and hit, this ground, hit the ground running and uh, do something for our uh, cultural history. I know um, that at least this guy will do something on the Dundas behalf anyway. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks very much, Dan, and from Glanbrook. Yes. Yep. Uh, good morning, and uh, my name is Ron Sinclair. I'm the president of the Glanbrook Heritage Society, and I'm also a member of Hamilton's Municipal Heritage Committee. Uh, the role of our society, probably in the smallest community in, in Hamilton, is to promote local history with a rapidly, within a rapidly changing community, specifically Benbrook, which I think is probably by many, I'm sure, the fastest growing community in the city of Hamilton. So, characterize this, I've lived here for 15 years in Mount Hope. I'm a president of a heritage society which the average age is about 83. And what am I going to say about history to people who've lived there and their families have lived there since Hundreds. So, um, but we have a new challenge. We have Binbrook. We have kids. We have large. We have families. So that's our our mandate to address that and promote a knowledge of local history with the new people in our community. Um, with respect to an inventory, my predecessors have done a lot of wonderful work, and I think they had the advantage of being small to do it. In 1984, then municipality of Glanbrook was able to get a Trillium Award, and inventory meant everything. So the decision was made that all properties and landscapes of interest prior to 1920 were put on a list. They were photographed, they were described and then it sat there until 2009. 2009, we decided we should be doing something with this in view of what was happening in our community. And we, in fact, toured 465 properties. Some of them are gone. It wasn't much of a tour. Uh, Fortunately, most of it's still there, and that's the advantage of being primarily a rural community. So you have a committed group of volunteers living in Glanbrook who live and breathe this stuff. We have, in 2009, with the help of cultural staff in Hamilton, uh, put it onto a database that describes, according to the city's standards, everything that we need to about a particular property of interest. 
So the next step for us is what we heard about from the gentleman from Grimsby. How do we move what we know is more than just worthy of being on a list to a register? To give you an example, of the 465 properties that we have on our list, two have been designated, two are on a waiting list, and only one is on a register, and we know that that's not accurate. Okay, tragedies in our case. Uh, building that was on airport property, the 447 wing. We woke up one morning in our drive to the office and noticed that it was halfway to being flattened. No discussion whatsoever. So the issue is a real issue, even though we don't live with some of the issues that Stony Creek and Dundas and the other communities do. So that's a bit of our stuff to a commitment from me on behalf of the uh, Glanbrook Heritage Society that you've got a ready, willing, and able group. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ron. <laughs> and other other folks, uh, ma'am? Yep. I know we've met. I can't recall your name. Sorry. Hi, Margaret Houghton. Um, I'm with the head of the Lake Historical Society. Uh, we're probably the granddaddy of the historical societies in Hamilton since we uh, were established in 1944. Uh, we don't tend to do as much of the inventorying as the other groups because we sort of do the whole city. We're the, the head of the Lake Historical Society. We tend to be more project driven and uh, we have done a number of projects that you probably would recognize. The biggest of which, of course, is we're the society that put the uh, fountain back in Gore Park in 1996. So. Um, we've, we're always looking for a project, so it strikes me, I was just talking to the president up there, Sean Carney, and uh, this would be something that we could probably really get into, and I want to uh, thank you, Councillor McCaddy, for bringing this up, because I think this could be very important, and the head of the Lake Historical Society will definitely back you on this every step of the way. Thank you. And also, personally, um, I'm the editor of four books called Vanished Hamilton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, four volumes. So, very good information. Thanks, Margaret. Now, I can ask the uh, ACO, I don't know, it, Barb or Donna would like to speak uh, on uh, the ACO's role and what we're talking about. Uh, I think as I alluded to a little earlier, the ACO in the local branch has been highly uh, focused on doors open the last few years, but we're taking the, uh, taking the cue from the 80th anniversary of the provincial organization to uh, renew ourselves. So uh, echoing on the words of uh, Head of the Lake Historical Society, thank you, Councillor McCatty, um, for um, providing this opportunity. I think our desire would be to, um, you know, as, as we renew, um, work with other historical societies. Um, the historical societies, you are the subject matter experts in your um, local municipalities that existed before amalgamation. Um, Architectural Conservancy can certainly bring, and I see here in the audience, one of our longtime ACO members, Tony Butler, a former president and also active on the provincial level, um, strong, um, strong documentation on uh, industrial sites. Uh, the ACO tends to, through things like our exhibit of Stanley Roscoe, um, the Pigott uh, building construction, tended to be um, uh, illustrating and uh, providing an opportunity for Hamilton citizens to learn about more of our modern buildings. So I think that's possibly an area that the branch could, in cooperation with the historical societies, primarily uh, head of the lake, a historical society could look at how we could, could fit. So it's not a firm, definite commitment of X number of buildings, but perhaps a couple of broad areas, and we'll certainly take this back to our uh, growing branch and, and see how best to fit in. Thanks. Now, I don't think we have anyone today from Flamborough, but uh, we have been in touch with Flamborough. And... Oh, we do? Okay, would you, would you like to speak uh, on the... Uh... You were involved with the Mill Street, uh, we work together, yeah, good. 
able to speak, so I didn't prepare anything, but I would like to say a few few things. Anyway, my name is uh, Andy McLaren. I live at uh, um, uh, on Mill Street in the Mill Street District. I'm chair of the uh, Waterdale Mill Street Heritage Committee, and uh, um, I just made a few um, notes here. Mill Street um, District was created by the town of Flamborough in 96. It continued through to 2006, um, where it was uh, disbanded with uh, lack of interest. It was tried to be restated in uh, 2010, um, but council decided uh, it would, uh, uh, they declined the request anyway. So we, um, we created our own committee, and it uh, started off with five um, members. It's now at 18. And uh, there's a real concern in the community because of what's happening in Waterdown because of the, uh, if anyone's gone to Waterdown lately, there's massive uh, construction pretty well on every corner. I know every com uh, community grows, but this, it's just exploding. And we have a real concern of the old town, um, uh, what's going to happen to it uh, because of the large properties. There's some gorgeous homes there. So we've created a, our committee, uh, which meets monthly. Uh, we uh, created it February um, uh, 2011, and uh, we're we're trying to get um, the word out almost to the community because some people move to this district and they don't even know they're in a district. Um, they they go to do um, renovations on their home and they realize they don't even they're not even in part of that district. Uh, to me, it should be part of the real estate when you buy. It's part of uh, they should be known. So some people don't even know they're in it. So what we'd like to do, we're trying to, a campaign to see if we can get. Um, all the street signs um, indicate Heritage District that you're actually in it. Um, we're, we're working on that now. Um, similar to what Dundas has, if anyone's gone to Dundas, it has Heritage District and the Mel, uh, Melville Cross. Um, we also look after, uh, like our main goal is to preserve the core. Um, so everything in the downtown area, not just the district. The district itself is, is 137 properties, which is the largest uh, um, heritage district um, in Hamilton. And, uh, but we're, we actually look um, over and above that to all, um, all buildings in the area, uh, as well as throughout Flamborough. And we're working on a two-year uh, campaign to save the Zimmerman House, uh, um, which is... Uh, um, we've done quite a bit of work on that, and it's moving forward. That's a, a boarded up property, a stone home that's been boarded up for 14 years and trying to restore it. So anyway, in closing, regarding, this is fantastic, by the way, thanks for the invitation, um, but I think it's great to get the word out for, for heritage and uh, preserving um, heritage properties. This uh, um, list of 7,000 seems absolutely overwhelming, um, but I know for our committee, I can speak for our, our committee, that um, if it's dissected a little bit and you take a certain amount, like say 800 that are in Flamborough or you know 1,000 up the mountain, and you divide it up, it, it doesn't seem so overpowering to have 7,000 properties throughout the big city. So if those, um, because I know that, uh, um, like I love heritage, I love doing the tours and all that kind of stuff, and our committee would have no problem um, even monitoring or even looking at uh, those properties. Um, so if we can divide up that uh, list a little bit instead of 7,000 to maybe 800, 1,200, 1,000 downtown, as you said, I think it would be fantastic. But I do think this is great, um, and uh, we're excited about the stuff that we've been working on. We work on other stuff like traffic and all that, which isn't necessarily uh, heritage, but <laughs> parking meters, <laughs> that was another fight. <laughs> so, but... Um, but I thank you very much for uh, allowing me to um, speak here today, and uh, um, and I hope that uh, everyone jumps on board for saving. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. Thank you. And, and we know Flamborough is such a huge town in terms of geography, and uh, there's lots of other information up there that's probably amongst the best in uh, in Hamilton. In the uh, we have to work with those folks to pull, pull together the other Flamborough information as well, Beverly Township and, uh, you know, the East Flamborough, West Flamborough, all the different areas. So that's great. Uh, uh, are there any other groups here who would like to uh, say a few words? I know um, Jan, I was going to say Janice from the Duran neighborhood. Uh, we, we did invite uh, all the neighborhood associations from across the city as well to the, to the discussion today. And uh, it's key that the neighborhoods are involved in this activity. They know all about their neighborhoods, of course, and 
we have one particularly special neighborhood, uh, the Durand, and uh, Janice spent so much time working on, uh, on that. Janice. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, this morning. Um, the speakers were outstanding, and uh, I certainly have uh, learned a fair amount. Uh, you are in the Durand neighborhood right now, and uh, just a little reminder, I think there were 80 houses situated here in the day uh, before this city hall was built, and I do remember that because I'm a North Ender and I grew up in the uh, lower city and spent most of my time here. Having said that, um, it appears to me that most of the of the action is going to come from the historical societies and being um, a part of a neighborhood association that was struck in the early days by my good friend Diane in 1972 when our beautiful houses were coming down and uh, hordes were going up and we then ended up with apartment buildings. There are many of us that are concerned about our heritage and the inventory that we have. Is there any way that neighborhood associations could get involved and help out with your inventory list? I know there's a large number of homes probably identified in the Durand. Um, I do not have access to that, but I'm, I'm certain that there are many of us that would like to help out if we can. And that is uh, my message to those of you that are um, instrumental in uh, perhaps making some changes in this fine city. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Janice. And as, uh, as we're speaking, I'm thinking about uh, Kayla's uh, building stories, uh, Tool of Waterloo, and, and how, I, I think, Kayla, you said that uh, heritage societies, I would suggest neighborhood associations, can uh, register as part of that and uh, provide input. Uh, and I should have mentioned, I didn't mention earlier on, uh, Kayla has been communicating with our culture department here at the city, uh, Ian Kerr Wilson and his group, uh, and they actually visited Waterloo, and, and they're uh, investigating you know, how the different computer programs can talk back and forth and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I should ask uh, Kayla as well, because I'm not a computer guy. I'm beyond my laptop. I don't have a smartphone or anything. So um, in terms of uh, hard copy, uh, uh, can, people, I suppose, can download forms off the, off the cultural or the uh, building stories and fill them in and maybe give them to us at the city or, or find a way to input them uh, to, uh, to the program, question mark. Uh, is it on? Okay, yes. Um, yeah, if you're registered, you could print them out, I suppose, if you didn't want to input things. If you, once you've inputted it, everything comes up as a report that you can export to print out. Um, so if you want hard copies. In terms of computers, um, at our end, behind the scenes, you can bulk upload and bulk download things, so the information's always accessible. Um, I could work on getting something that would be paper fill out. If people wanted to do that, um, you'd have to designate someone to input it. But I can, I, that's something I can put on my list. Okay. And uh, just one quick question on that as well. I, am I right, uh, Kayla, that you you're, you're have the ability to do some additional, beyond today, um, some additional workshops on, on this tool as well? Um, so right now, uh, uh, we've got, or the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario got a grant um, to work with us to do workshops in municipalities across Ontario. Um, so the Hamilton branch, therefore, can host a workshop. So I would leave that up to them on how they would want to do that. Um, there is also a training video online. So it's a seven minute, I think, training video. And we do have the ability, obviously, to do additional workshops, um, and we would have to figure out how the costing would work with the municipality. Um, so. Maybe we'll follow up with ACO on that uh, issue in particular. Are, are there, in, in a moment, I'd, I'd like to take the last uh, 20 minutes, half an hour or so we have to uh, just open up to, to any questions or thoughts people have. Uh, questions from some of the uh, wonderful speakers we had uh, this morning. But just before we do that, are there, are there any, any other uh, societies or, or neighborhood associations that we've missed uh, this morning? We've uh, captured most of them. Okay. Well, uh, go, go ahead, Maria. Yes, Ian's here. He's been trying to hide. Uh, but uh, Ian uh, Keir Wilson is here uh, at the, in the back row there at the city, so we're working... Uh, on, uh, on that project of a thousand uh, properties downtown here through Ian's group and 
we're working very closely together. Thanks, thanks, Maria. Okay, so um, if you'd like, uh, if you want to come down to the uh, one of the microphones, perhaps at the front here, uh, if anybody has any general questions from uh, any of the speakers or or have uh, things you've been thinking about as I've held you captive uh, listening uh, this morning. Uh, Graham? Yeah, Brian, thank you. And thank, thank you to everyone at the table here and in the stands as well. Uh, I must say, I, this is my first exposure to building stories. And uh, my mind is just racing with what we can do with it. But I, the reason I wanted to say something was I think one of the things that I'm not clear on, and the group that maybe has met and talked about this is much clearer than I at the moment, even if we had everything uh, spelled out, if we had photographs and history and plans and stories, the fact is we haven't designated a property in five years. Uh, I've attended lots of council meetings, you've attended all of them, and uh, there does not seem to be an appetite for designation. So the root cause of this problem we face is not the fact that we don't have these 7,000 properties with additional information. Because my worry is, and having attended Municipal Heritage Committee meetings in the past admittedly, so this might have changed, but there was basically an unwritten rule that unless the owner said, I want to do it, nothing was done. So there are any number of root cause problems here, and at some point we'll need to meet to talk about how do we deal with the fundamental problem, which I don't believe is pictorial or informational? It's attitudinal. I still think we should do this, and I'm going to do whatever I can through history and heritage to help. Um, but we've got a bigger problem here we, we're not talking about. Yeah, that's a, if I can just respond to that, and others can as well, of course. Uh, uh, we, we did talk about that. Um, I, I think we decided to sort of tackle this issue sort of in compartments. So we, we know that uh, this list of 7,000 is out there and as long as it remains a list of 7,000, it's not going to be very effective uh, in terms of bringing forward. Uh, it would be fairly easy for politicians, amongst others, just to say, just to throw up their hands. Uh, you know, we don't know what that really means uh, <clears throat> and how do you deal with that many properties. So I think the focus today and, and uh, the discussion of from the various uh, municipalities, the areas, uh, to try and bring that list down to a list of, pick a number, I have no idea how many are going to uh, be there for the, the register that would actually qualify for the register. Maybe it's 3,000 or maybe it's 4,000. I think, I think that work still has to be done. So leaving that aside as one compartment, we come to Graham's uh, comment and uh, there's no doubt with no designations in the last four years and I think Jim's presentation saw Hamilton off to a fast running start and a great leadership role in the 80s uh, and 90s. Uh, you know, the ACO, uh, the first, first organization of its type, the Hamilton chapter, uh, the first designated property, uh, the Sandyford Place. Uh, there's just all kinds of firsts in there and, and a lots of designations and, and we're fourth now. Uh, it's obvious people are catching up to us or perhaps have gone past us. In the, in the last number of years. So I think that's uh, accurate, uh, uh, Graham's observations. Uh, it has been a great frustration. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a little difficult for me as a politician to talk about uh, council, my colleagues uh, in that sense, and Councillor Pearson would have the same, uh, same uh, concerns. But I, I, I think uh, there does need to be uh, a discussion uh, on the advocacy side of this uh, equation. Uh, to be very frank, uh, politicians uh, sit there with a number of issues, and uh, to some degree, uh, you know, you, you decide whether there's a, a political cost to doing something or not doing something. And there hasn't been one. One, one could assume uh, by recent uh, happenings, there hasn't been a cost 
to not designating or not tackling the list or, or not adding properties to the register. Uh, got away with it on city council. Uh, I don't know how that happened or, or uh, how to turn that around. Um, I think that's really, uh, really up to you. Uh, and I'm, of course, Councillor Pearson and myself and others are here to, to talk about that and to, uh, to strategize perhaps on that. Uh, so I think, I think it's still very important to do what we're doing today in terms of the inventory and, and, uh, and then there's the education piece. Uh, I think uh, Michael in particular spoke about that. You need to set the stage for this. Um, you know, some of us are totally focused on this stuff. Just give me the list of 5,000 and off I go. You know, let's, let's put it on the register tomorrow. That's where a lot of us, I think, would be in this room. Uh, but I think we need to educate uh, folks on the value. Turns out uh, the value of these, these heritage districts, the, uh, the prices, uh, the assessed, assessed value of houses in that area are go through the roof. It's a good place to live. Uh, the, uh, when you designate properties, uh, it doesn't mean you can't do anything. The uh, Alyssa would say from Municipal Heritage Committee that uh, I think the number was 97% on, uh, on Jim's list. I think ours is 97 plus percent of uh, heritage permits that come to modify those designated houses. Uh, about 97, perhaps 99% of those were approved by the, by the Permit Committee that uh, Alyssa and the Municipal Heritage Committee administer. So it's not as scary as, as uh, as it might, uh, some might think, that's the education piece, right? That we need to talk about that, and the value of districts. That we haven't done a lot with uh, with landscapes, with the cultural uh, landscapes. Uh, that tool, and, and that's an opportunity that we uh, have as well. Um, so, anyways, I won't uh, say any more. Uh, Graham, you've obviously hit a nerve uh, with me on that, so uh, a positive nerve. I mean, I, it's it's a it's a, something we need to deal with for sure. And uh, Tony, can you talk to us next, and then Chris? Thanks very much. Um, I've been around the heritage business for a very long time. I was one of the founding members of the Hamilton Lack Hack and its second chair. It was the same, at the same time I was on the Hamilton Historical Board and, and took a leave of absence for the time I spent on Lack Hack and then went back to the Historical Board. And my interest in our built heritage has been long lived for me. I'm very pleased, Brian, that you're here and we have one other member of council here as well. Um, it's pretty sad that we only have two here. And I think the big issue is how do we get our councillors to even acknowledge that this is an important issue? Most of them probably don't care. I'm pleased to see that there are representatives of various parts of Greater Hamilton here. One of the problems with our councillors is that they appear to focus entirely on local issues that affect their own potential voters and don't really think in the bigger picture in terms of um, how do we deal with issues that affect the whole of our city. And <clears throat> so I think with the groups who are here today who represent parts of our city and obviously therefore parts of the wards as well, um, should be concentrating perhaps on getting their own councillors aware of these issues so that it gets out of the, the, the bottom of the pit, which is where it seems to be all the time in council, up to a significant issue that we, uh, that they will recognize as, as important as all of us here today recognize. So, thanks very much. That's a very good advice, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor McCaddy. I think all of us here would like to express our appreciation to you for mobilizing uh, the participation of these tremendous experts and, and support uh, that we can draw upon here in the city. So perhaps we can just give you another hand of applause for <laughs> showing leadership in a city where sometimes uh, we lack for it. Uh, perhaps we should preserve some of that as a historical remnant. But nonetheless, what I'd like to suggest, and I'm following up on, on what uh, 
we've heard already both from, from Tony and Graham, uh, I think that we have some tremendous resources here in the room around the issues of cataloging, identifying uh, heritage properties. But I would suggest respectfully as we leave here today that those of us who are passionate about our built heritage and preserving it here in the city consider creating a political action committee. Uh, that we can mobilize that crosses uh, border uh, ward boundaries, uh, former municipal boundaries that would mobilize um, political resources, lobbying efforts to really impress upon elected councillors what the uh, what the cost is politically of not supporting uh, our built heritage. I think that we have to create, like we have done around other issues, the environment, the economy, jobs, uh, that we have to create a, cli a political climate in which there is indeed a political cost for failing to support uh, the preservation of our built heritage, a failure to step up to the plate, as it were, to uh, support the citizens who are gathered here today. And I know that we represent but a, a tip of the iceberg of a passion that uh, exists throughout this city for uh, our built heritage. So I want to suggest that there's two things on that we could do. I know that there are those uh, here today who counseled against, you know, creating a list in which we suggested A, B, or C. But as um, someone who mourned, uh, I was age 18 at the time and I was uh, the youngest member of the Flamborough LACAC and I'm a past president of the Beverly Heritage Society, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Task Force on Heritage, the uh, Hamilton Conservation Authority's Heritage Board, so I go a long way back. But I remember as an 18 year old, just my heart breaking as I saw the demolition of the Grafton building. Some of you may remember that. My heart just broke. And that was 1978, and here we are, are all these years later, still discussing the same issues. So I think we need to certainly consider creating a, a firewall where we say these are those bu uh, buildings that are most at risk, that need to be designated by bylaw now, today, and bring to bear a political action committee that will lobby effectively to bring that about. And then, as I say, a broader based political action committee that will ensure that properties as a whole and those that support it are given the respect before council that they deserve. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Erskine. Um, I think the, the the Building Stories website is a fantastic idea. Um, it's a, one of the things that was just mentioned is the list of 7,000 buildings is very intimidating. Um, it becomes a blur, it has no meaning. And by encouraging the historical societies, the neighborhood associations, and just people from the community going out and documenting the important buildings that we have in the community, it's a way of making these fantastic resources uh, aware to a larger population and makes it meaningful. I think um, I have a great respect for the challenges that City Council and the Economic Planning Board and the Cultural Committee has with trying to save buildings. I'm almost anti-City Council in a way because I view it's not so much the City Council's job to do this. I think it's the neighborhoods and the individuals who need to do this. I, I think one of the great success stories of Hamilton uh, is the James Street North uh, with the artists. I, my view is the artists are saving Hamilton because they're, bring, they're allowing old buildings that haven't had a function, have been abandoned or not fully used, to be find a new economic purpose and bring communities back to life, make communities feel safer, feel, make, reveal the possibilities of what communities have. Uh, and I think as, as a way of uh, moving Hamilton to a new vision where it's an urban village, where it's a walkable city. Hamilton is a, uh, my family's been in Hamilton over a hundred years and I cannot tell you how proud I am of this city and all the, the different neighborhoods and different communities. And I think we're at the beginning of a very successful period and part of our success will not be knocking down these valuable resources in the community 
but in, but incorporating incorporating them and finding new value. Uh, Car uh, Carla Jones uh, does some fantastic stuff through discussion groups on 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 heritage buildings, and a point was made one by one of the participants is yes, the first part is saving the building so it's not torn down. But the second and even more important part is finding a new purpose for the building. It can't just sit there empty. It's got to have some some value meaning to the community. It's, it's just a, a big paperweight. And so finding those, showing developers what they have in their hands, what they can do with that. Uh, uh, whether it's first bringing in artists and the arts community and creative groups, you know, CBC Hamilton coming here, uh, revitalizing the community, uh, and then moving on as uh, as the tr trouble building and the, the, the developer who was talking about his various projects, those sorts of things. There's lots we can do. We don't have to knock them down because uh, we feel that there's no other way we can have economic value of it. And I would really stress to everyone, that the, in addition to the historical societies, the neighborhood associations are a key component. It's their territory, they have to be involved, they know what's going on, and then the people within the community, the businesses, the local the residents, they're key. And so this, uh, this process of documenting uh, photographs and uh, supplying histories behind these buildings is the first step to bring in greater awareness to the fantastic community which we have, which we call Hamilton. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to Jeff and his buddy Darko. <laughs> Hello, I'm Nina Chapel, and I was a heritage planner from 1980 to December 31st, 1999. Is that when all those designations happened? I think, <laughs> I think it, was. it was. Well, with my colleague Ann Gillespie and some ter terrific LACAC committees. They were very wonderful and, and a, um, positive and took a lot of initiative. What I really want to tell you about is the resources that are available to all these um, neighborhood committees and historical societies because that list it was this 7,000 or 6,000 or whatever it is list, I haven't seen because it got amalgamated with the government amalgamation. But um, they, were, they were all based on really good research. The first, the foundation of it was the Canadian Inventory of Historic Buildings, and believe it or not, that was the one in 1967 and 68. And it was the National Inventory. Then we had um, Anthony Adamson come. He was an architect, a major architect in Ontario in conservation, the father of conservation in Ontario and in, uh, deeply involved in the Dundurn Castle. And he, got, he came at the request of, I've forgotten which group, and he came on his, got on his bicycle in Hamilton. He's from Toronto, got in, and he went around and um, went up and down all the streets in Durand and um, just and in the downtown area. And that was, there is a map in heritage planning of the buildings he raided. And uh, then the LACAC had a research uh, subcommittee. And we did lots of, I was as staff, but these committee members did lots of walking er areas in Duran. There's a whole list, a whole inventory of, of buildings that were raided by this committee. And this material is uh, located in the planning department in the heritage section of, of the planning department. Then we also did things like um, Tony Butler's industrial um, tour. We did a lot of background research in that, so there's a tremendous amount of material there. We also did another study of public buildings, and so there's whole files on the public buildings, and um, modern buildings, contemporary buildings, and an awful lot of material sits there. And when we were working at City Hall, we always opened it up to the public, and I hope it's still the same, but it is in the heritage planning section of the planning department. And I urge you to go in and look. Start with the inventory, the addresses that are 
in your inventories, and I, I know Flam Road did an inventory, and um, Dundas, I know that because I was involved in it, and these separate communities, Ancaster had an inventory. So they, the material is there, there's a lot to build on, so I just urge you to take advantage of everything that's been done before, it'll make it a lot easier. Thank and you. we're working Excellent. on the gore as well, right? The, you've got some information on the gore that we're... Pardon? You're, you've got some information on the gore uh, Oh, the well. gore, yes. Oh, yeah, gonna, and we have it in uh, spades. On yeah. that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks, Dina. Hello. Hi, uh, my name's Alan Stacey. First, I'd like to thank Brian. And the first thing I'm going to say is... Uh, Political key, political will is the acorn that will make the oak grow, and this is a perfect example of it. But as somebody pointed out, there are only two councillors in this room, which is a great disappointment to me personally. Uh, I'd, I'd like to then carry on, on regarding uh, Brampton, which was an interesting case study. Uh, it was interesting that Brampton is listed fourth uh, of current designations, I think with 20 properties. Uh, this is a, a, a basically a municipality that is basically urban sprawl. But the, the city there has a very good heritage policy at the moment, and I would certainly relate that to Alderley. And I will personally thank Jim and all his colleagues that was instrumental in saving that building. Our company was fortunate to do all the heritage woodwork on that building. If anybody can go to Brampton and view it, it's an Italianate uh, masterpiece. And it's a total asset to Brampton. And, and uh, we have a property similar in... in uh, in Hamilton called Okma that languishes. Um, we, we need to find a use for it, um, and if we can, then it's, a, it's actually disgusting. An amazing municipality can let a building of that historic and architectural merit go to rot, as it is presently. I, and I, I will uh, say there is some work being done to it, but there is no real policy for Okma per se, and it is a cry and shame. Uh, my second point is, um, one of the speakers brought this up, I think it was uh, Michael, education and, and, and youth. Uh, I'm actually pleased to see today that I'm not the youngest member in the audience, I often am, and I'm actually going to turn 50 this year, but there are a few younger people than me. Uh, we need to bring this to the schools. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that Dundurn doesn't have school uh, visits anymore. I, I, I'm... Is that correct? They don't, no. Oh, they do. Oh, sorry. I thought that had actually been pulled. Okay, so that's good. Thank you for clarifying that. But this is where it starts. It starts in the schools. I mean, I was uh, obviously brought up in England. Uh, there is uh, a greater heritage aspect in England than there is in Canada. We need to take this stuff seriously. There's only so much of it here. Indeed, uh, part of our mandate as a company is to provide education. We feel that we have to give something back to the community, and our most successful way of doing that in heritage is to actually give lectures. And uh, anybody who would like to pick up on that, we'll be more than happy to do that. Um, but like I said, recapping, I am very, very pleased that you put this meeting on. Uh, my only negative is it wasn't very well publicized, and I literally found out about it at the last minute. Um, but uh, maybe we Oh, we can... tried. We worked oh, hard. Oh, really? On that. Okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't see it anywhere. But I actually picked up on it at the, uh, the um, meeting on Tuesday. So just, uh, just conscious of the time, I, I do uh, want to get people out by 12.30. Uh, um, so, whatever I can ask you to wrap up. Yep, I'm good yep. with that. Right. Again, thank you very, very much for putting this meeting on. I think it's well overdue. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Councillor McCaddy. I have a very brief question, and uh, my name is Michael Clark. I, I wanted to clarify something that uh, Michael Seaman had said earlier. Um, and, uh, and I may have completely missed the point. I don't know what the... Uh, what the, um, uh, the mechanisms are, but I understand that the goal is to designate these properties so at least we have a 60-day window before somebody um, uh, applies for a demolition permit to allow some sober second thought, I think is how it was put. Um, but I heard, uh, uh, I thought I heard the comment that in, in Markham they had a list or a similar inventory that we have here and that the, the city council or the municipal government, did they designate all those properties holus bolus all in one? And th that was my impression of it. And I thought, is that possible to do? Um, what we're talking about is the Heritage Register, and uh, which is the uh, designation is a whole other step. That's a permanent 
uh, protection and, and, uh, and entrenchment. The, the register is just really a, a way of a mechanism for delaying des demolition. Okay, so the heritage register then is, is an intermediate step. Yeah, the, 60 days. That's before 60 you days. get to the designation. Yeah. Once you get to the designation, you can't demolish? It's really for situations exactly what you're in, in yeah. terms of it, there was a recognition that, that you know, there's no way that, that Hamilton could go and designate and do all the like pages and pages of research on 7,000 buildings right. proactively. Within but what's plan. that intermediate step, the uh, where you get the 60-day reprieve? What's that called? The register. The register. Are, are these 7,000 properties on the register? No, that's uh, that's our major focus today. We've okay. only got about 30 properties across the city on the register. Okay, so right my next today. So, my, so let me finish. Okay. Um, yeah. So our goal today is to take that list of 6,000 or whatever it is and determine how many of those properties should actually go on the register. So we have to assess those properties uh, to see if they qualify for the register. It's quite easy to qualify for the register, as Michael okay, will so, tell us. And yeah. then we need to work through planning planning committee. The recommendations go through Municipal Heritage Committee, through planning committee to council, and they go on the register. So as I understand it, in Markham, they were able to put a number of properties on the register. Is that right? And that was done fairly easily? In Markham and Aurora, they recognized that the um, Just a bit louder, a bit louder, in, Michael. In Markham and Aurora, they recognized that the restriction being only 60 days, that's it. What's no. better than nothing, though, right? No, but they recognized that the, the 60 day demolition um, prohibition was a fairly minimal uh, imposition and just simply passed a recommendation taking their old municipal inventory pre 2005 and saying, These, okay. This shall now be All right. a heritage register. I, I think I got that. Now, the, um, and there's very little pushback from the owners of the properties. Correct. Okay, so my question then, Councillor, is well, why couldn't we just take our 7,000 properties and give them that uh, registration? Go, what, could that not be done right now? Be nice. Yeah, so... Like, like, like so with, 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 just with... Because I'm aware of the time. I, I, I understand, you, but you I think... Question, let me... That's I can, okay, go ahead. I can answer that. So, so I think probably you need to go back to Graham's comment earlier that there hasn't been the political will to do that. Okay. Because uh, it, it goes through Municipal Heritage Committee. We make a lot of recommendations in Municipal Heritage Committee. A number of them are ignored. This past week, we'll celebrate victories. Uh, so three of those recommendations went uh, to add properties to the registry, and the Planning Committee passed them this past week. So round of applause for the Planning Committee. Yeah. That's all great. But it, I think it's just a matter of building the, uh, the will. I think some municipalities have, have done almost that, taken the 6,000 or whatever number it is and just, right. just plopped them on the register. And that's, that hasn't happened here. We need to build the political okay, will. Okay. That, that, was, that was my practical question. Like, can that be done? And it sounds like the answer to that is yes, it can be done. So um, we've heard that a lot of people have done some work already in identifying these properties and putting them on this list back to the 1960s. So why do we have to go and, I mean, we're going to, we, we want these people in this room here to take this to the next level so that we can get designations of things. But can't we just get to that intermediate step now? That I, think, I think you've mis misunderstood. Maybe the the reason here today is to do exactly that, yeah. to get to the register, because I think Michael made it very clear. Uh, putting something on the register, okay. the 60 days of protection, it's not that scary right. for private property owners or anything. If you designate, that's a whole other discussion. Let's get so to the register. So that's exactly what we're focused on yeah. is the register, yeah. But get as many properties on the register as possible and, uh, as the next step. That'd be fantastic. I'm going to have to cut you off, though, because we're... But, uh, and, but, and there'll be time to talk afterwards. Just so, the only uh, question was, can council yeah. do that with a stroke of a pen right now, if they had the will to do so? Well, they could. They could if they, if they wanted to, yeah. So just before we take the final speaker, uh, Rob, I want to make sure that, uh, that people have signed in, right? Because we want to make sure we, uh, we follow up with, uh, with actually doing some of this work that we're, we're talking about. So that's just right outside council chambers there is the sign-in form. And uh, the, uh, the various societies, I just wanted to thank them again for uh, <clears throat> putting out the presentations out there. The, uh, the information on the tables is great information. And... Uh, <clears throat> just, I'm just sensing we're lo losing some people, uh, Rob, so I wanted to say that before we lost anybody else. And just huge thanks to our, uh, our speakers uh, today. Uh, real inspiration, I think, for me personally, and I suspect uh, everyone in this room uh, for, for that as well. So, uh, and I, I just also wanted to uh, recognize uh, 
Uh, one of our Heritage Planning staff is here. Alyssa Golden is here somewhere. Alyssa in the back row beside Ian. And Alyssa actually did the original work on the 1,000 downtown properties that Ian is, is now also working on. So that was fundamental work and uh, no doubt uh, following in the steps of Nina and uh, her work here in the city of Hamilton. So I wanted to recognize thanking Alyssa for coming today and spending part of her Saturday uh, with us here as well. Rob? I just wanted to underscore the opportunity that's being afforded by having such a diverse group here and bringing the information forward and considering, uh, uh, and I hope that's the way we do ultimately go, is convey that information to the public, public build public uh, ca political capital by having it uploaded onto a system that uh, Kayla's been presenting today. I, I hope we go with that or something similar to that. And I'd also make a pitch for the Hamilton Museums. I'm the current chair of the board, but will take no, absolutely no credit for what's going on in terms of the presentation of the museum and its programming and its assets through virtual museum. You can visit every museum site and take a virtual tour of the museum going right down to the rooms and directing your own walk through those uh, resources. Now, uh, Kayla's presentation doesn't do that, but what it does is it reaches out to Hamiltonians and beyond. And frankly, uh, as limited as the museum sites are, the, uh, the councillors do know that those museums exist because there is that kind of in-your-face uh, development there, and it's something that we're supporting year over year. It's right in the budget plan. It says we're uh, supporting this pr particular line item program. So to bring those 7,000 or 6,000 items out of the folders in files in the heritage section and bring them forward to the public to consider, that's where you're going to go develop your political capital. The general public have no idea, so having it out there will be great. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rob. Okay, well, I think at this point we'll uh, draw the, the uh, meeting, uh, the discussion to a close. Uh, we will be staying in touch with folks. Uh, again, that list and number of folks who couldn't make it today who emailed us. Uh, so we'll be following up on this. And again, thanks very much to uh, everyone for attending today. And again, the speakers, fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you.